Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, July 12th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, author Eleanor Cleghorn, author of Unwell Women, Misdiagnosis and Myth in a Man-Made World. Also on the program today, unprecedented protests erupting in Cuba. Meanwhile, Joe Biden fires the Trump head of the Social Security Administration. About time. Police hold suspect in the Haitian presidential assassination. <clears throat> New documents show the EPA approved forever chemical PFAS for fracking 10 years ago. U.S. Senate back in session. The fate of the infrastructure bill to be resolved. And as Texas pushes its voter suppression bill, national Dems look to reconfigure voting rights to address most recent Supreme Court rulings. The Afghanistan drawdown is just about complete as the top U.S. general steps down. Biden urged to appoint a third FCC commissioner to restore net neutrality. And lastly, a heartwarming story of a Tennessee teacher about to be fired for assigning a Ta-Nehisi Coates article for reading. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Sorry, we're running a little bit, uh, a little hectic here back in the office um, and just uh, working out slowly rolling in our tech uh, changes. But uh, fortunately, our technology has allowed Emma Viglin to be here today. Yes. Emma, good to see you. Yes, good to see you, right? I mean, the, the audience may not be aware, but I'm one of those holograms like Michael Jackson or Tupac that they, uh, they that's right out there. So that's, I would say, what is... 80, Sometimes eighty percent of your budget. That's right. We spend a lot of a lot of money uh, bringing in the hologram in here and making it as lifelike as possible. A um, lot of other shows would just have you show up, but um, but I'm lazy. So. But in this instance, it's much easier for all all of us involved just to have the hologram uh, produced, um, and uh, someday we'll be able to market that technology. That's the hope, anyways. That's what your membership's uh, going towards. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you for your support, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is Monday. Um, hope everyone is well. We're in the middle of the summer. The Senate is back in session as of uh, today. And there is going to be a mad scramble on the infrastructure. We're going to hear more in the coming days about uh, reporting about the um, both the bipartisan bill and the reconciliation bill. And all of this is going to come to a head over the next couple of weeks, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and we will have a better sense of, <clears throat> of a lot of things, including, I think, what ultimately will be uh, the success or failure of the Biden administration from a legislative perspective. Uh, if they fail to get a um, two complete infrastructure bills uh, it is basically over i think at that point um and then hopefully 
they will get as many judges in as they can until 2022 and then we'll see from there but um we're going to have a much better sense in uh in the next i would say 30 days maybe less yeah i mean maybe it will the, the self-imposed deadline at the start was what the end of july but it seems like it's going to extend beyond that the I don't know that this will be done by then, but we will be far enough down the road right. to know whether this road leads to anywhere. Um, and we have several um, federal support systems in terms of unemployment and whatnot that are ending at the end of uh, the beginning of September. Uh, August is generally there is a um, uh, another vacation. And so, um, like I say, we, yes. will, we will have a better sense, uh, at least of where we are with all of this by then. They deserve it. They deserve, <clears throat> they deserve it. It's yeah. been two weeks and they just got to get back on there. Um, we, uh, <laughs> we will get to that story of a teacher who, who's teaching, let's be clear, a contemporary issues class back in February and later in March, um, he was playing a video of white privilege, a spoken word poem by Kylie Jenny Lacey. Uh, and also um, this teacher assigned an essay that was first in the Atlantic uh, magazine written by Tana Hasey Coates, the first white president. And um, apparently that's enough. That's a firing offense in Tennessee. I remember that. I remember that essay, which purely because I remember it, you should fire me. Well, uh, what is amazing is the outcry that we would hear about college campuses that people have <laughs> been protesting uh, and somehow prevented uh, the Student Activities Council for supporting, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos or Ben Shapiro from showing up. Yet when we're actually talking about a public school where a contemporary issues teacher assigns a Tana Hasty Coates article, and with all due respect to Tana Hasty Coates, this isn't the most radical of uh, of radical writings. No. Um, but even if it was, I wish it was. I wish it was a little bit more radical than Tana Hasty Coates. But regardless, I mean, the idea that this is grounds for firing. Um, you know, this is the thing is that there are, there are news stories that go on every day and, you know, uh, this has been from, I want to say time immemorial, but time immemorial when it comes to cable news, right? Like 15 years ago, I was on CNN arguing with somebody the, the, the male president of the Concerned Women for America at the time <laughs> about the existence of the war on Christmas. And he cited some school in Wisconsin where they uh, they changed the name like of silent. They, 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 they took Jesus out of the, the song Silent Night. Now, apparently they had done that like 20 years earlier or something like that. It was just a different tune, whatever it was. And that existed. It was real. But was it catching a phenomena that was existing? If you hype that, understand that you are building a narrative in, in media circles and also know how all this works in this country. There is an existing power dynamic. And so the idea that the salience of one guy on cable television saying that there's an anti-white agenda like Tucker Carlson, for instance, there's an anti-white uh, bias in this country versus hundreds of students saying this in a college. Well, even if you were to put 100 students in one college and 100 students in the other, we have history in this country. We have an existing power structure. You need to assess what constitutes news and what constitutes an actual danger to society based upon those contexts the history of this country the structure of this country where the wealth lies all of it and 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 to divorce yourself from those realities and claim that one threat is as much as another threat is um is completely blinkered 
I'm sorry. Like, you know, it, it's just there. there's a difference between a, um, you know, if you have uh, kids under 10 and you have a window open on the first floor, it's different than having kids under 10 with a window open on the 10th floor. Well, I mean, it's also just incredibly important to understand that it's a part of a larger project of one completely concealing those power dynamics and two making things like this tennessee story possible because this is a part of a mobilizing effort by conservatives with this critical race theory stuff because if you're involved in your local school board then you're certainly more likely to be involved in your state house races and you're more likely to be supporting republican candidates in those races and then it works on its way up to congress and on in governorships and that's a bit of like the mobilizing of the the troops on the ground here this is a part of a, a, a of a political project not a news one and so that false equivalency is very instrumental yep yep meanwhile i didn't i didn't uh, mean to uh, start off the show that way but that's the way it works around here occasionally cpac happened this weekend that is where all the um the lunatics in the country go for uh, a weekend uh, to, to say hi to treat. each other and yeah. network. Um, hey, look at this innovation I have in insanity. Well, let me top that with this, um, this innovation uh, in, in my insanity. And then they get together and- um, And they I, synergize the insanity. They synergize. Um, here is Anthony Fauci, not as, um, used to CPAC, I imagine, as most of us who are in this business where we watch it every year in the same way that you would like. Um, Not used to know. being a central figure at CPAC at the very least. Right. It's it's sort of like um, a subject of conversation. But like, you know, it's like, I don't know, the first time you see penguins walk up onto the beach or something like that, the March of the Penguins. But if you if you work in that industry, you know, like, like a oh, mar yeah, the March yeah. of the Fascists. It just happens. Well, yeah, here it is. Um, here is Anthony Fauci watching a clip about vaccination, and he is <laughs> horrified. Remember, we now know that while the Delta variant can can ha be responsible for breakthrough infections, in terms of hospitalizations and deaths, it is about as close to as um, you're, you're, you're not quite 100% safe, but you're close to about 95, 98% safe from hospitalization or death if you are vaccinated. And here is uh, Anthony Fauci watching people shower and bathe and swim in, in just pure ignorance. And potentially COVID. And potentially. To do with politics. <laughs> it's a public health issue. It doesn't matter who you are. The virus doesn't know whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, or an independent. For sure, we know that. And yet there is that divide of people wanting to get vaccinated and not wanting to get vaccinated, which is really unfortunate because it's losing lives. The um, conservative political conference, CPAC, uh, is going on this weekend. I wanna play for you a clip of one of the speakers from that event yesterday. They were hoping, the government was hoping that they could sort of sucker 90% of the population into getting vaccinated. And it, and, and it, and it isn't happening, right? There, there's a younger people. I'm going to cut him off right there because he just goes on to just say things that are not true about the vaccine. But what I wanted to get your reaction to is the crowd cheering when this gentleman talks about how the government was not able to achieve a 90% vaccine goal. The crowd cheers. Um, as a public health official, what's your reaction when you hear that? It's, it's, it's horrifying. I mean, they're cheering about someone saying that it's a good thing for people not to try and save their lives. I mean, if you just unpack that for a second, Jake, it, it, it's almost frightening to say, hey, guess what? We don't want you to do something to save your life. Yay! Everybody starts screaming and, and clapping. I just don't get that. I mean, I, and I don't think that anybody who's thinking clearly can get that. What is that all about? I, I don't understand that, Jake. On the other side of the political spectrum, the former health... <laughs> yeah, Jake has no answer for that because uh, he doesn't want to say. 
That um, was Alex Berenson, by the way, who uh, the Atlantic wrote a piece on him called The Pandemic's Wrongest Man. I would encourage people to read it because he's been wrong every single step of the way when it comes to the pandemic and predictions and just in science that he purports. And he seems to shift a little bit, too. He's sort of like one of those guys who are like, one time at uh, when I play 21, I'm always going to hit on 13, and then I'm always going to not hit on 13. Well, you know, when you're trying to pretend to be calling shots, you've got to cover your bases by calling every shot. There you go. Um, All right, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Eleanor Cleghorn uh, on her book, Unwell Women, Misdiagnosis and Myth in a Man-Made World. We'll be right back. Folks, today's uh, program is sponsored by Honey. At we least were, in part. We were just talking about this. We were just talking down. about this because Matt was like, apparently we had a monitor that like melted. Um, supposedly. I don't know. Matt has some very big requirements for monitors these days. Um, like he's got, we, we got like a, a huge, like, what is that? Like a 75 inch monitor that we have over there. That's curved it's and ultra it, wide curved screen. Yep. Ultra wide curved screen. And it also like gives Matt a massage during the thing. <laughs> Anyways. So he claims that one of the other monitors that apparently wasn't up to snuff for him was melted. I went on uh, line. I got, um, I looked for a monitor and boom, honey pops up. And in this instance, it didn't have a coupon for me, but it did say, Ooh, wait a second, the prices had a big increase. And so we were like, wait a second, maybe we should check for another one. And then I found one that had a price decrease. Whoa. Yep. And that's the thing. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online. Ranges from sites that have tech and gaming products to popular fashion brands, even food delivery. So here's how it goes. You're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the honey button drops down. You don't have to do anything. It drops down and it says, apply coupons. Click, they search over like, I don't know, sometimes it's three, five different coupons. If one works, they plug it in. Or if there are no coupons, they tell you price drop, price rise, all this. They found over 17 million members, over $2 billion in savings. Every, um, well, me and Milo, let's put it that way. Saul doesn't buy stuff online. But um, we got honey on our computers, and it gives me the peace of mind of knowing, A, that there's no worse feeling than thinking, like, is there a coupon out there to save you a couple bucks? For me, anyways. And so even when honey says there's no coupons, I'm like, okay, Whew. at least I'm not leaving money on the table. Look, if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free. And it installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you're going to be doing yourself a solid and you'll be supporting the podcast. Uh, you know, I would never recommend anything I don't use. You get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash majority. That's joinhoney.com slash majority. Speaking of something that I do use... Came in today, told everybody, got some extra liquid IV. People can stock up. Today, for me, I even brought down one of these things. I got uh, a watermelon. Oh, not matcha today. Not matcha. Nope. I even mixed it up a little bit. Hot summer months are here. You got to be proactive. Got to keep yourself hydrated. One stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates faster and more efficiently than water alone. Plus, it tastes great with flavors like watermelon, strawberry, and lemon and lime. I don't know. I, I don't know why they don't like uh, your acai. Oh, God. Maybe these are acai. summer. Acai. Acai. I don't know. I know. I know. Uh, Liquid IV contains five essential vitamins, has more of a vitamin C than an orange, as much potassium as a banana. It's healthier than those sugary sports drinks. There are no artificial flavors or preservatives and less sugar than an apple. Liquid IV is powered by cellular transport technology. The optimal ratio of glucose, sodium, and potassium delivers water and nutrients right into the bloodstream. The company has donated over 4 million servings in response to COVID-19. Products are being donated to hospitals, first responders, food banks, and more. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I've told you multiple times. Uh, generally, almost every day, I am full-on matcha. 
uh, because that is my coffee substitute. There are times I mix it up a little bit. If I've been drinking too much, I have liquid IV. If I'm taking a trip, I'm worried about, um, you know, getting a plane. I take a couple of packets with me. Life hack. If you have been drinking that night, drink it right before bed. Yes. You feel much better in the morning. Yep. Uh, and also, you know, it's been hot and I want to stay hydrated. And sometimes I'll do it before I even like even think about it, which is good. I'm like planning ahead. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com. Use the code MAJORITYREP at checkout. It's 25% off anything you order when you get better hydration today using promo code MAJORITYREP at liquidiv.com. And lastly, I got some fruit growing this year, folks. I got an Arkansas black apple tree that is performing exceptionally. And I have two, I think it's called Hosni um, Korean pears trees. They're big, big. They look like apples. What? How is that possible, Sam? Didn't you just tell us you got those trees last year? Yes, that is true. I got them during COVID. But the beauty of fastgrowingtrees.com is that they send you trees that are like fast growing they the fact of the matter is they're already big that's the bottom line trees go like this like this like this and then they're like people they just shoot up and you get closer to the point where they're shooting up and they send them right to you you can skip the big box stores you head to fastgrowingtrees.com the world's largest online nursery and you can get trees fruit trees you can get shrubs you can get plants for your home you don't have to wait in lines you don't have to mess up your car it doesn't matter you can be looking for shade trees privacy trees fruit trees like i said or just added color for your yard every plant is shipped with a well-developed root, root system that's the key folks you can put it in the ground but if it dies what's the point you gotta wait a whole year to, to do it again Planting season is here. Join over 1 million satisfied gardeners at fastgrowingtrees.com. Plus, the 30-day alive and thrive guarantee means your plants will arrive happy, healthy, and ready for planting. Now through July 31st, go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash majority for 15% off. That's 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash majority, fastgrowingtrees.com slash majority. I can get me one of those red maple trees. That's what I'm looking for. All right. I uh, want to welcome to the program Eleanor Cleghorn. She is the author of Unwell Women, Misdiagnosis and Myth in a Man-Made World. Uh, welcome to the program, Eleanor. I'm here with Emma Vigeland. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start with uh, your own personal story that led you to to look into this, which is a, basically a history of a dynamic in medicine, which has been um, uh, uh, not good for women, I guess is really the best way to put it. Uh, tell us about your, your own story and how you came to decide to write the book. Yeah, of course. So in 2010, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease called lupus. And it's a disease that affects 90% more women and people born female than men. And I was diagnosed with it after I developed a life-threatening heart condition and was rushed to the emergency room. The heart condition was very mysterious and I just had my second baby who also coincidentally had a heart condition while I was pregnant. And it turned out that both of these conditions were being caused by my own immune system, which was mounting in response and actually attacking the function of first my unborn baby's heart and secondly, my heart. So I was given a diagnosis by a rheumatologist who's a specialist in autoimmune diseases and really knows how to kind of piece through all the symptoms and what kind of blood work to ask for. But generally speaking, there's not a, a lot of knowledge, of, of consistent knowledge in general medical practice about autoimmunity and how to diagnose it. Lupus ordinarily takes between four and six years to be conclusively diagnosed. 
So in this respect, from when I first got really sick to when I was diagnosed, it was pretty fast. But actually, for about seven years before my diagnosis, I'd been having what I now know are the characteristic symptoms of lupus. So these include joint pain, migraines, photosensitivity, so being sensitive to the sunlight, um, mental health issues, I think, associated with being in a lot of pain. And whenever I went to the doctor, invariably, I was dismissed as either being anxious or hormonal or one doctor suggested I might be pregnant and not realize it. Another tried to diagnose me with gout. Um, and this kind of went on and on, this just general sort of disbelief, diminishment, dismissal of my pain. So, I mean, really I had an underlying disease, but I was never referred for any diagnostic tests. The pain was never taken seriously enough to be seen as an indicator of something else that was going on. And, so the book really came from a realization that this experience I'd had was a profoundly gendered one. And I started to look through medicine's history as a way to sort of come to terms with my, not just my illness, but also the lack of kind of understanding around what autoimmunity is, why it affects more women than men, you know, why it's so unpredictable. I was a history researcher at the time that I was diagnosed, looking into feminist histories of art. So this was kind of my impulse anyway, to look back, to try and understand where we are now. And I came across all these women in case studies, textbooks, you know, and across the annals of, of medicine over, you know, a century, two centuries, three centuries. And there was something so familiar in their experiences that I thought, well, okay, you know, medical science has progressed exponentially, you know, but yet our medical attitudes towards women's bodies, especially towards women's pain, especially towards illness symptoms that aren't maybe immediately diagnosable, hasn't really moved on much at all. So that was really the impetus for me to tell this story of why a woman like me and, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of others, were experiencing, you know, sort of degrees of medical neglect, degrees of medical mistreatment. And I just wanted to really go back to the beginning of medical history and sort of build this story of how we got to where we are today. How, I mean, and, and it, it really, when you see it in the context of, of history, it really becomes um, rather, sort of, I mean, uh, you know, very clear. It really is sort of amazing that you could sort of if you had a, a time machine, go back in time and really almost see the exact same doctor. Uh, it, <laughs> Pretty much. But with that said, how how do you? And then I want to talk about that history. But how do you? When you had that realization that it was gendered, like how do you? Like what is the counterfactual? Had you gone in as a man, and I'm talking prior to the pregnancy, right? For those seven or eight years, like and it. it I mean, it's absurd that they never said like, hey, you know, this has been going on for like two or three years or four years or five years or six years. Maybe we should take the next step. What like, but how do you, as you come to that realization that it's gendered, how do you make that, you know, what, how do you formulate that counterfactual? Had you gone in there and you, you, you were uh, a, a man? I think there are a couple of things working against women when they go to the doctor's office, which was something that when I was first diagnosed became a kind of anecdotal or intuitive realization because I was diagnosed and then, you know, I would talk about this experience with female friends or relatives and there would be invariably some kind of similar experience. Oh yeah, doctors don't listen. You know, I went through awful menopause symptoms, doctors didn't listen. I actually had undiagnosed heart disease, doctors didn't listen. So it became more of this kind of intuitive sense that women just generally are disbelieved, you know, societally are, tend to be disbelieved, underestimated and taken less seriously especially when they speak about their bodies. I mean, I could see this if I didn't know necessarily at the time how systemic and ingrained this was within medicine. I, could, I was certainly very aware of it, you know, systemically and culturally and socially and other, other ways. I mean, now, you know, bias studies into medical gender bias that have been conducted over the last sort of 20 years since this issue has really started coming, pushing through 
have shown that it's not necessarily to do with biological sex that it that you know is set against us but it's to do with the way that gender expression gendered expressions of pain and bodily symptoms tend to how they are when they're spoken you know how how seriously they're taken so men not all men of course but men tend to express pain and things that are going in, on in their bodies in a much more straightforwardly descriptive way and of course men do tend to go to the doctor less if they have a worry about their bodies and pain they, they don't tend to speak about it as much but when they do studies have shown that men tend to be very descriptive so it might be like i have a pain here it's been painful for two weeks and that method of speaking that method of kind of straightforward sort of testimony really stands in people's favor when they want to be perceived as being legitimate women again not all women tend to feminize their expressions of bodily pain so if a woman goes to a doctor's office and speaks about a pain that might have been you know thwarting her for for months or years maybe she might tend to express that pain in a more social more sort of psychological and emotional context in how it might affect her loved ones how it might affect her work her relationships you know have her getting the kids to school however that might manifest and that sort of narrativizing almost sort of storytelling around it is stacked against women so we are perceived as less legitimate because of the way that we relate to pain you know so I think as a man I mean it's it's difficult isn't it to tell but I mean certainly anecdotally I've heard that men do tend to have their pain more you know rapidly and sort of seriously responded to and there are certainly studies that have been done that you know bear this out and we should say I mean and I think what the history makes it clear too is that probably a big reason why the the responses to those expressions um have disparate uh reactions is a function of the sensibility that has dominated the med medical providers so that th it's what they're responding to and they associate uh the description of pain basically because uh it has been a male dominated profession and so the I mean, it really is just like, oh, it's easier for me to empathize with a guy because I know what a guy talks like. And so I know what you're saying. The other thing sounds like eh, you just got some. Sounds hysterical. Sounds a little hysterical. <laughs> I think about that a bit too, because I think, you know, you, you, in your book, you talk a little bit about some of these co this coded language in history, right? Like hysteric, hysteria, even going back to the days of witchcraft and stuff. And um, I think it's also important to note that uh, in terms of the, the data that you're citing, there's also a heavily racialized component as well, where uh, women, black women specifically, um, when you look into statistics in terms of pain assessment, they uh, are not perceived uh, as empathetically by doctors. And there's a kind of a vein of, uh, of you know, science around it. So no, it, it can't be, there's no way that this could be um, influenced by our own perspectives, right? We're coming at this from a scientific method. And so there's an arrogance that's associated with that, um, which is a roundabout way of me asking you about kind of endometriosis, which you write about, which is a long, painful history for women in terms of forced sterilization and just historically that being misdiagnosed. Um, if you could talk about that uh, within the context of your book. Of course. I mean, endometriosis now is, I always think, a, a really sort of woeful example of, of how medicine has failed women across its history. And we've now inherited this legacy today where we have, you know, one in 10 women and people with uteruses are estimated to have endometriosis. It's a major cause of infertility. It takes up to 10 years to be diagnosed in the US and in the UK too. Um, it's very difficult to treat and knowledge, you know, clear, accurate knowledge about endometriosis and what is the best pathway and treatments for that disease are very muddled. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, hysterectomy is often uh, touted as a cure, but it isn't a cure for endometriosis. 
But what endometriosis, what has happened with endometriosis is the symptoms or the major symptoms, because it has many different symptoms, but the major symptoms associated with menstrual pain, with menstrual bleeding, these have been symptoms of associated with the sort of failures and the sort of irregularities and mysteries of the female body for centuries. So they've got a very long association of sort of myths being ascribed to them about how the female body is just sort of naturally defective because of its sort of quote unquote normal female functions. And endometriosis, although the symptoms, we can see the symptoms being um, documented really thoroughly throughout the history of medicine from, you know, the classical ancient authors until, you know, right up through, you know, developments in, in surgical diagnostic procedures, you know, we can see also some of these myth mythologies and how much sticking power they have had. So, for example, endometriosis got its name in the 1920s. And when more research was being done into what the disease actually was. And when this disease was first named, there was a lot of really promising research into it. But then one of the major physicians, um, an American guy called Joseph Meeks, he came in and he did these broader studies on it. And he decided that it was predominantly a disease that affected white, sort of career minded younger women, sort of, you know, 18 odd. And he decided that the cure for endometriosis was to, you know, procreate vigorously and often until you hit menopause and couldn't do it anymore. And this has really stuck, you know, this idea that it's predominantly white women who get endometriosis, that it's predominantly an illness of women who are child free, you know, who, who put off childbearing has stuck. I mean, and it's obscured, you know, this mythologizing has really obscured research into endometriosis to the point where now, you know, we've gone through since the 40s when this guy was making his theories, you know, we've had incredible uh, advances in medical diagnosis, yet we're still parroting the same language around who gets endometriosis, what kind of person gets it, and what we should do to cure it. And it wasn't really until the 70s that endometriosis was even identified as a disease that could affect black women, which is appalling because you think about, you know, how much just hasn't been researched, how much information and data just has not been gathered. So yeah, endometriosis, I think, is really a sort of error example of these failings. And we should say, though, too, I mean, it's not you can't see from the outside of someone's experiencing endometriosis if the tissue is growing on the outside of the uterus and it's incredibly painful and so a lot of the dynamics that you're describing about how it's more generalized and it's more i feel this way I, you know it's affecting me in terms of my fertility in ways that may not be necessarily pinpoint you can uh point to it, it it's it, it really does i think envelop a lot of the dynamics that you're talking about I think that's completely true because before a, di a disease can be, you know, diagnosed and treated, you sort of first have to kind of run the gauntlet almost of being, of having those symptoms that you report to your doctor, to your GP, taken seriously as evidence of an underlying disease. And, you know, we can see that symptoms like menstrual pain, like bodily pain, you know, these symptoms that are more sort of that carry these, that are weighed down by these, you know, medical myths about women's relationship to pain, you can see how diagnosis is so prolonged and delayed, because women have to have first got that job of convincing their healthcare provider that these symptoms are not just, you know, the inevitable consequences of having a female body, but actually evidence that something else, something really serious is going on. Uh, let's go back to well, uh, close to the beginning, I guess, and 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 talk about wandering womb, uh, which is, I mean, uh, you know, on one hand, man. it's sort of like, <laughs> what? Yeah. And then on the other hand, it's like, okay, that was a long time ago. I mean, was there, tell us what wandering womb uh, is or what or was, was believed to be. But what also, like, I'm just fascinated to, you know, if we had a, uh, an author here who tracked specifically men's health, although that would be almost like equivalent on some level, particularly, you know, up until extremely recent times, 
health, right? <laughs> I mean, that's part of the problem. But like, was there a, I don't know, a version of, of, of wandering womb for, you know, men like, oh yeah, we also thought that like, um, we had some weird things that we believed about men too at the time. Like, but tell us what wandering uh, womb is. Of course. So my book begins in ancient Greece, which is the period of, of medical history that I would sort of mark as the beginnings of what we would now see as our Western evidence-based scientific medical model. So the Hippocratic authors, so this is Hippocrates in the history, they were the, the first physicians who were writing about the care and treatment of illness in the human body by doing what doctors more or less do now, which is interpreting symptoms, making a diagnosis based on those symptoms, rather than applying sort of religious mysticism or something to knowledge about a person's disease. So the ancient Greeks, while they were bringing, you know, a more sort of considered and thoughtful and symptom-based analysis of, of illness and health into medical ideas, they also didn't have an awful lot to go on in terms of how they figured out what was actually going on underneath a person's skin. So the ancient Greek physicians were not dissecting they didn't obviously they didn't have you know x-rays they weren't taking temperatures so they were approximating and a lot of that approximating was filtered through social and cultural ideas about gender and gender roles in society so women being predominantly reproductive or predominantly kind of their main social role being to be become pregnant bear children and raise children so it makes sense that in that time in history, that women's diseases would be interpreted primarily through their reproductive capacities. And so the womb being the sort of sent being the vessel of life, you know, they attributed the womb, the uterus as the sort of center of women's health and disease. So the healthiest state for a woman to be in, according to the ancient Greek physicians, was pregnant because the ancient Greek physicians understood bodies in terms of humors, in terms of balances of moisture and heat. And it made sense to them in terms of this, you know, sort of strategy that when a woman was pregnant, her, her womb was anchored and moistened. And when it wasn't performing this social duty, it would become dry and go creeping around the body in search of moisture. And as it went creeping about the body in search of moisture, it might, you know, press up against the liver or, you know, venture nearer to the heart or even kind of climb up and almost suffocate, you know, the woman. You hear a lot in the ancient medical literature about this thing called suffocation of the womb, which was a sort of convulsive illness that was believed to be because, you know, the uterus was sort of meandering around, having a wander about looking for looking to kind of find its healthiest state so it sounds completely outlandish and actually in the context of the ancient greeks when they were trying to puzzle out like why do people get sick you know who are men who are women why did where does illness come from what causes it it's not altogether illogical but what is illogical is the way that this idea that a womb could meander that it had appetites and impulses of its own What's illogical is that then that mythology sticks with us and, and it grows throughout the history, you know, it sort of expands and develops across the centuries until we get to the point where women are kind of ruled by their bodies, that they have this almost animal inside them that longs for, you know, intercourse and pregnancy and conception, and therefore that women do not have control over their bodies. So the evolution of that idea becomes illogical, right? It, it leads us to many of these sort of ideas that shape even today the dynamics between, the gender dynamics between patients and doctors. In terms of men, this is really interesting because men were seen from in the ancient Greek physicians documents as a stable example of a human being you know men were men were the ideal form of a human 
you Men know, have... their genitalia was outside of their bodies. It could keep nice and cool. They could, they also were out working in fields. They were, you know, creating all the sweat and heat that they needed. Their bodies were in balance and their bodies were stable. So we just don't get that same kind of sort of erratic mythologizing about what's going on under there because men were seen as these ideals who were sort of exercising their human body in the way it was meant to be exercised you know or used and, and it also i mean it incentivizes complete sexual dominance and control of the woman if she needs to constantly be pregnant and also you know at that point she's your property um that serves the man in some way i can't even you know articulate fully but yeah obviously that's that's anyway it's just very convenient and interesting go on yeah it's also interesting too because if the the if the male is the control group then anything that is wrong is um and is is problematic if you know pain at that point becomes problematic because this is a system that's supposed to be working at peak efficiency and Whereas if you set the the woman up as um, as being erratic, then obviously like, oh, well, pain. Well, that's just simply part of it. And uh, and, and that's and and, and and that takes or us all the way. She's not having enough sex. Or she's well, yes. Right. But but it's the idea being that these are these these symptoms are not indicative of a problem on some level. They're indicative of like normal functioning. And for for women and that that carried uh, thousands of years up into uh to your diagnosis on some level um let's move forward in time a little bit and how did christianity uh in the uh 14th century how did that add to this sort of already burgeoning i guess dynamic where uh women are essentially their wombs uh, and um, everything that comes along with being pregnant is just sort of the norm on some level. Uh, and 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 men, I guess, you know, once you've achieved this, once you're the control group, you're the control group, I guess. I think with so with the movement of medical knowledge or the development of medical knowledge from the ancient Greeks into you know Christian theology, what you get is you know medical discourse survives over the centuries because it's translated and transmitted by men who own knowledge you know who own the ability to read who own the ability to create knowledge there are little pockets of resistance of course but in the main the people who dominated and owned this knowledge were men so when the ancient and classical theories about illness were um, transmitted and translated by christian theologians they it was also respun with new myths from Christian theology about women not only being other and um, inferior to men, but also being corruptible and corrupting and polluting and potentially poisonous. Because you have the fa foundational myth of Eve, of course, of Adam and Eve. You have these foundational myths about women being, or women's bodies specifically, and their sexuality being somehow responsible for the unleashing of sin into the world. You have that in a foundational myth. And so, of course, these foundational myths of Christianity shaped the way that medical knowledge or medical ideas were then respun in light of new religious beliefs. And what's interesting about the 14th century is that we're sort of hovering on the precipice before the witch trials that happened in Europe, across Europe between the 15th and 17th centuries. And of course, like with any, you know, horrendous events in history, the witch trials didn't just come out of nowhere. You know, there are very complex reasons for these witch trials, but partly it was because there was knowledge set up or knowledge put in place about women's bodies and mind that assumed women to not only be defective, but also highly dangerous or potentially dangerous. And what protected women from the danger sort of embedded in every female body, more or less, was her ascribing to societal and religious norms of marital sex, you know, being very quiet and well behaved, having many children, not speaking out. You know, these, these were qualifiers for good health because they were towing domestic and religious ideals. They were towing the line of domestic societal and religious ideals. 
And there was, again, some, you know, hugely outrageous theorizing from certain religious kind of pseudo medical writers who talked about how dangerous it was for men to consort with women when, you know, they were menstruating, how dangerous it was to consort with women who had impure thoughts, you know, because they could influence, you know, not only what was going on with the with the fetus, but also like potentially um, cause, you know, horrendous contagious diseases, pass on diseases to men. So women took on this kind of, you know, defiling, defective, corrupting nature that they always had to keep in check. You know, the idea in the 14th century is that it's potentially there in all women, because all women are potentially sinful. So again, men are the victims of this sin, not the perpetrators. They have to protect themselves from you know the defiling and poisonous nature of women so yeah it's it really is a matter of sort of layering the layering of old learning old foundational ideas about health and illness with new kind of wilder myths that take that those old foundational ideas and really re-spin them into something that's very punishing and actually in the case of you know the 14th century turned out to be exceptionally punishing for women across europe let, let's jump ahead and to, to the early 1900s um, because we're entering into a different era of medicine on some level where it's becoming more, I think they would say it's more scientific. Um, and, 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 and it is on some level. Um, and this horrible story, which I was not aware of, of uh, James Marion Sims. Um, and... I was also not aware that they took down a statue. I don't remember uh, the people protesting uh, in Central Park that we were destroying our history uh, when they did so. But but tell us um, the, his story and the story of the women who were subjected to this guy. Of course. So James Marion Sims was a, gyne a gynecological surgeon who was practicing in the sort of early to mid 19th century. And he was a doctor in... Uh, Alabama in a town where two thirds of the population were enslaved. And he established uh, what he called the first ever women's hospital in his backyard in the town of Montgomery in Alabama. And what this really was, was an experimental clinic in which James Marion Sims was perfecting gynecological procedures, surgical gynecological procedures in order to sort of further his reputation and you know, you know, make his mark on what at that time was a burgeoning professional discipline. You know, gyneco gynecology was at that point in the 19th century becoming becoming a serious gentleman's discipline. When before it had just been seen as you know bikini medicine or whatever we call it now. So Sims was is known today for perfecting a procedure that cures a uh, vaginal fistula, which at the time was a death sentence. It's a horrible injury that can happen after birth and it's, it causes infection and causes prolapse. And it was pretty much incurable at the time. And because Sims was a physician to, to the, on the plantations, slave owners would bring women to him who had had difficult you know, injuries during pregnancy or were unwell after giving birth. And he thought that this, this horrible injury, this horrible disease was incurable until he decided that it was permissible to experiment on enslaved young women who were suffering from it, always without anesthetic, until he developed you know, a procedure that would cure this, that would treat it and put it right. And he experimented on many different victims and he speaks very egregiously and vaingloriously in his posthumously published autobiography about their pain, about their suffering, about their screams, and it's horrifically hard reading. And the issue is, is that Sims was lionized as the father of modern American gynecology for a long time, because this procedure he developed for the fistula was life-saving, you know, it would, but, but the, the genesis of it was that he was using disempowered women in performing dehumanizing experiments on them until he got this procedure right for the benefit of white women. And he also invented a particular speculum, the duckbill one, or modified 
the duckbill speculum. So he has these kind of, you know, achievements within gynecological history too. But the horrifying thing is about it is that the achievements of someone like Sims were for a long time completely, you know, they were whitewashed because the history of how he came to make these advances is incredibly harrowing. And it was unfortunately bolstered by racist misbeliefs that black people, that black women experience less pain, that they were invulnerable to pain when compared to white people, white women. And I would imagine promulgated those those myths too, okay. right? I mean, that's the thing is that it's, it's not, yeah. that allows him to experiment on, on these women. But the fact that he experimented on these women also then sort of uh, promote that that idea. I mean, there's a there's a lot I want to I want to get to, but we're not going to have time. But w tell us about Primarin. Well, let's jump ahead, uh, I guess, almost um, uh, 150 some odd years or so into the um, mid to late uh, 20th century. Um, w what is Primarin? So Primarin was one of the first estrogen supplements that was, so it was a sort of precursor to what we would now know as kind of hormonal estrogen therapy, what we call HRT, hormone replacement therapy in the UK. And it was called Primarin because it was made from mare's urine. So it was crystallized estrogen, synthetic estrogen that was, um, sorry, not synthetic, synthesized estrogen taken from the urine of, of female horses. So that's where it gets its smashing name from. And it was developed after sort of years of theorizing about hormones that began with ideas about internal secretions that emerged in the later 19th century, when, you know, the earliest theories about hormones were developed by gynecologists and endocrinologists who were trying to isolate what the essence of femininity was, what the essence of masculinity was. And before they knew to call these essences hormones, they called them internal secretions. So by the time Premarin was developed, there was a real race to sort of isolate these essences. You know, and by that time, they knew what they were, you know, testosterone, estrogen. And estrogen had already taken on, you know, all the characteristics that we have associate with it now that it is a feminizing that you know it stabilizes women's emotions that without estrogen we are you know cantankerous and unruly and and Premarin being the first of those you know it's it pretty swiftly rushed to market and very popular and it was really emerged onto market with a real narrative about how women when they were you know drip fed chemical femininity, that they would be pleasing, that they would be, you know, affectionate and quiet and docile, and that they would, you know, be happy in the feminine role of mother, of wife, of, you know, and of course, Premarin being, a, you know, a, a drug associated with menopausal replacement, um, hormonal replacement, was was associated with kind of leveling out the sort of cantankerous older wife. And honestly, some of the adverts for this stuff are just, you know, laughable, but also so enraging. You know, you have ads with like a woman proffering some, some uh, you know, party snacks and smiling and her husband looking at her, you know, dotingly. And underneath it says, Premarin, help keep her this way. You know, so it was really couched in this kind of narrative of, you know, you want a pleasant wife, you want a wife who's agreeable, drip feed her chemical femininity. So that's what Premarin was. And of course, hormone replacement therapy, along with the other history's other major estrogen supplement being the contraceptive pill, were then mired in you know, lack of research, lack of transparency around side effects, and became real sort of hotbeds for uh, fe especially feminist health activists when campaigning in the mid 20th century to you know for medical transparency to be told the truth about what they were taking so we've got you know medicine again is trying to invent this medicine to correct a problem that essentially it created which is the idea that women just kind of become sort of you know domestically and kind of useless the minute they um childbearing days are over i it's it, it... When you, when you hear it like that ad, I guess is what really stuck out for me um, was, you know, 60 years ago. And like, it's not, you know, it's just, um, 
that's pretty deeply embedded in our culture. Uh, that's um, uh, pretty stunning. All right, we, so with just a minute or two left, where, where are we now? I mean, you, you, you know, at one point you cite the Marie Curie Hospital. I guess that was in the um, early 1900s, I think that was. Um, that was having a really a lot of success in terms of cancer relative to what the success rate was for cancer. And that was an all women's run hospital. Um, and now uh, I think we're at like 37 percent of uh, doctors are, are, are women. And that's changing the nature of medicine. In just a minute, where, where would you say we are at this point in this sort of very, very slow evolution of medicine? I think we're at a reckoning with the cultural reckoning with this issue. I think we are coming to understand how systemic this issue is. I think we're beginning to um, treat it as a legitimate issue. I think for a long time, the treatment of, of women by the medical establishment has gone unchecked. You know, it's a system of power that has gone mainly unchecked. I think we're now in a, in a reckoning with it in which, you know, we have got more interest in the press. We're having more sociological studies into what bias means and how that affects people's health. And as you say, we're having, you know, an increase in women within the medical profession and also now i believe that women in both the uk and us medical schools slightly outnumber men in entry to medical schools so i feel like we're we're in we're on we're in the midst of a reckoning much overdue but we also hopefully are sitting on a kind of precipice of a systemic change where implementable strategies that really do address these blind spots these neglects these kind of mistakes of the past and they need to be addressed with systemic change that comes from funding, that comes from women's health issues being prioritized at the top level of research, and also with you know, development of implementable strategies so that these mistakes of the past aren't just repeated you know, ad infinitum, and that across the whole of a woman's life cycle, you know, her relationship to her body and her understanding of what's going on in her body should really be respected in its entirety. And that's gonna take systemic as well as cultural change. You know, women from the grassroots up can do a lot, you know, to draw attention, but we also need the system to change too. And hopefully, I can only hope that it will. Eleanor Clegharn, the book is Unwell Women, Misdiagnosis and Myth in a Man-Made World. Thank you so much for your time today. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm. Thank you so much for having me. All right, folks, quick break, and then we'll be back to wrap it up. We are back and just uh, wrapping up uh, the show for those folks who are watching us on Peacock. Uh, thanks for joining us. And we will see you again tomorrow. Yes. And for those of you sticking around, I, I can't get over. Like when you hear like an ad like that, and I mean, aside from all the other horror stories we heard, but we hear like an ad like that, like that, that ad probably aired close, if not while I was alive. Um, I, I mean, mean just think I'm that. old. All right. But yeah, I'm not that old. Um, and the idea that that like it, it just I, I was yeah. also just thinking about some of the practices of what with which you know women would essentially be knocked out with hallucinogens when giving birth in the 50s and 60s i mean it's like you, you, the the body is a vehicle for child creation and any kind of complications are are defective and met with scorn and i will say my, my mother had cancer and um some of these i'm going to get her this book because i think she would really empathize with some, her breast cancer some of the um some of the some some of the way she was treated in terms of how uh doctors reacted to when she was experiencing certain things so um definitely definitely a real phenomenon and stuff i've experienced i once had to see a male obgyn and uh i mean it's not i like men can be good obgyns but it's, it's harder i would say 
it's harder. Um, <laughs> I I also would imagine that this dynamic extends to like even. I would imagine to like the psychology profession and psychiatry yes. profession in terms of like a medication. Um, I would also imagine it is um, not just gendered and, and she, she, she does, you know, delve into uh, the, the particular sort of challenges that the medical establishment has uh, in regards to uh, black women one stat that stuck out for me and i wonder now it, what w w all the things were behind it is that um prior there there was apparently insurance rates for for black folk was much lower than white folk in this country uh at least the health insurance rates and early data showed that there were far less overdoses amongst black people when it came to opiates in the wake of like the oxycontin um uh issue because they didn't have the health insurance to to get the pain medication to get addicted to right. and i'm not convinced too that there isn't a dynamic there where the doctors were like well you're not really in pain so we're not going to give you the oxy um i would imagine that that's complete speculation on my part as to it, but I would imagine that may have played a role as well. Um, I mean, there's a 2016 survey of 222 my, white medical students and residents found that half of them endorse at least one myth of uh, physiological differences between black people and white people, including that black people's nerve endings are less sensitive than white people's. Um, this is from the New York Times magazine. And I mean, a lot of I was trying to find this because I couldn't remember. Um, oh, wait, this is insane. Yeah. A third of these doctors to be also still believe the lie that Thomas Hamilton tortured John Brown to prove nearly two centuries ago that black people, uh, that black skin is thicker than white skin. So there are a third of doctors entering into the profession, medical students, that believe black people's skin is thicker than white skin. I mean, that's terrifying. Um, they're like doctors are in their society is seen, seen as unimpeachable, right? But they are subject to all they're of, human. They're human. And also there's limitations. And when you think of, when you think of, um, things from like these, this perspective, that's, that's in, you know, I think quite narrow, um, of Western medicine in many yeah. ways. <laughs> well, there you go, folks. Um, we're going to take a quick break, head into the fun half. Just a reminder, it is your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, don't forget, um, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off of that coffee. Uh, fair trade, they're a movement partner uh, over at Just Coffee. And we should also say... Um, the results are in. I have made a commitment to the sun's out, guns out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to do it this Friday, uh, fun half. You keep pushing it, uh, pushing it off. Well, there, there's a controversy. Why? Because uh, Ronald Reagan, who folks who listen to the program know, he's this bully who bullies me around. He, he, yeah, he's he. He like tortures you actually. Too. Well, I don't want to say He's that. Like I don't the want Sam to to your Stephen Crowder. Yeah, exactly. He was, I mean, sending Sam a hundred cookies when we know what his, yeah. what his issues are. I it's mean, it's a bully thing, right? No, that's torture. It's a bully thing, yeah, no, or torturous. No. I'm going farther. torturous bully. Yeah. And um, so he sent a shirt, and I'm not sure where it is. Um, it's not inconceivable at at different times that it may have. I don't know. I don't know. It's lost in the office. And he originally was the first one to do the sun's out, guns out. Now, I was intimidated uh, by him and, and felt like I was being bullied too much. And then I made that the deal with the audience about if they bought a certain amount of tank tops. I didn't think tank tops were that popular. So I thought I was sort of safe. Well, some people like to show their guns. Also, people are ready to get outside this summer. I guess yeah. so. 
because the so sun's out, so the we've, guns are out. We've sold a hundred uh, tank tops. I don't know what the the you know the black and the white ones. I don't know what the what the breakdown is. And so I said foolishly that I would do I would wear one. I would do the sun's out, guns out uh, on the on the fun half uh, for the show. And then, uh, you know, my bully, my personal bully, you know, uh, starts to threaten me about wearing his shirt. So I may have to wear multiple shirts during the show. So it'll be involving, like, I'll have to get up, I'll have to walk, go into the changing room that we have here. The bathroom. Well, we have a changing room, too, for, for specifically for things like this. Okay, the bathroom. And it was a huge waste of construction costs to I build a changing that. room just for the, like, the one or two instances every three or four years that something like this happens. But yeah. I felt it was important. Doubles so, as an old equipment room. Yeah, exactly. That's, and, where, that's um, where my hologram server's housed. <laughs> um. Anyways, I'm not sure what the point of that was. Go to the uh, merch shop, shop.majorityreportradio.com. We also, I think we still have a few uh, left of the, um, oh no, Sam Cedar, what a fucking nightmare shirts. You don't want to wear the tank top for the Peacock show? I mean, maybe. <laughs> maybe I will. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, I, I, I actually think there might be a problem with the logo, but if I wear a non-logoed one, uh, maybe I could the get away The Raygun one, yeah. Although, like, yeah. we have a logo right here. I don't know why well, that would be an issue. I, I, I can't say anything about the merch store. I, right. I can't explain why I'm wearing it. That's the only thing. Um, <laughs> oh, I could do it. I could explain during the middle. Yeah, I, maybe I will. Just say, it. I think I look good in this. It's sun. It's sun's out, <laughs> guns out. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Well, tonight for Left Reckoning patrons only, David Griscom and I are doing a think tank. So if you want to get your questions into that, join uh, patreon.com slash left reckoning. And then we have some more fun stuff coming up later this week. We got uh, Victor Pogge talking about Brazil and Lula and uh, Bolsonaro and uh, this uh, sort of COVID vaccine kerfuffle he's got going on. And we'll also be talking to Andrew Hartman about the history of culture war. Uh, very interesting book he wrote. Uh, we'll be talking about him. Um, that might be a members only thing too but uh probably released for everyone so patreon.com slash left reckoning okay see you in the fun half you are in for it all right folks six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty see you in the fun half oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. are you ready oh, no. well, who sent us this the alpha males are back, 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 boy, is back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, is back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, wow, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. nightmare. bring back DJ Danner. Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psycho. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, 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 oh. Snowflake says what? 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 Hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 
black and the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are back. Back. Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. What? Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. It is the fun half of the program. We got a lot of stuff going on today. Got CPAC. a lot of clips, a lot of CPAC clips. The um, actually CPAC this year was, um, I would say, not just restrained uh, and responsible, but I would also say, um, in many respects, were impressive. There were panels uh, talking about conservative perspectives on 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 Im improving people's lives and uh, different policy uh, objectives and strategies. Um, then, uh, I mean, come on, Trump Jr. April Fools. Yeah, let's start with Trump. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> also, people got really wasted. <laughs> it seems like it's kind of his permanent state of being, though. There was, uh, when we first started the majority report, um, I built some type of wheel, I think it was. And we would spin it, and maybe it was three wheels. And we would, uh, to describe the latest Thomas Friedman um, uh, column. And one would be uh, which metaphor he was gonna use. And the other one would be uh, which antidepressant he was on to, uh, to <laughs> to keep himself from feeling bad about what was going to happen to his career when Iraq went awry. And then I can't remember what the third one was, but you know, and we would spin it and then just go like, Oh, it's the rickshaw and the Wellbutrin. And, um, and maybe it was the topic of the thing. I can't remember. Um, and then when, uh, I directed a fake reality show, there was a member of the cast, I'm not going to say who, um, whose performance was influenced, in my opinion, based upon what drug that person had taken that morning, early morning. Sometimes I suspected it was something that was snorted because of they would occasionally just get a bloody nose. Oh. Or other times they were really, really friendly. And I thought, hmm, this reminds me of talking to someone who was on ecstasy. And then other times they would just be a little bit, I don't know, introspective. And that reminded me of someone who was on pot, smoking pot, not on pot. Anyways, I don't know why I bring that up, but here's Donald Trump Jr. at CPAC. You know, Texas has always led the charge Well, till about like a couple of months ago, and then Austin sort of took over. Like, I don't know, guys. Like, Texas was leading the chart. You're still top 25. But we got to work on that stuff because those people have lost their minds. Right? The people's. I was trying to think of like what. Do we have a, lo a longer version of that? Can we find a longer version of that? That just, he's. He is. Uh, I'm 80% sure he's coked out, but no, you're not, you're I'm not, not a, a drug doctor. You're not a drug, this is completely, I'm your sorry. Opinion. Yes. It's and... completely my opinion. I shouldn't say that. Um, you know, I don't know. I, or just, you know, maybe even he's just trying to act like that. Um, but, uh, I, I should say also, he reminds me of like job from arrested development that's what it just put me put it together for me the way he talks i mean will arnett 
Yeah, he's he, there's like a Will Arnett like kind of nervous quality to him. Yes. <laughs> I will say this. I read that Vanity Fair piece about Gavin McGinnis. And uh, it said that he had an Adderall addiction. I don't know why I brought that up. Yeah, why are you bringing that up? I have no idea. I'm just talking about that Vanity Fair piece. So, um, yeah, there's something going on with Don Jr. He's... I shouldn't speculate about his drug use. We don't know if there is any drug use whatsoever, but it seems like he's retaining a lot of water in his face. <laughs> like, it's a little bloated. And... Um, there's a lot of twitchy movements, and I've seen photos of his eyes. Yeah, I just think like the mindset of guys like that, like for like Adderall, that that sort of thing, like that makes a lot of sense to me because these guys aren't gonna go up there cold. They're gonna they're gonna want some little edge. You think like pitchers in sports are like trying to get every little edge. You think these guys aren't gonna have a little something before they go on stage? Well, I mean, he's not gonna prepare, so he's gotta at least feel like he's prepared, feel real confident, because daddy's gonna be watching. Well, there's also the idea, this, this, is, what, this is what gets, this is what makes me uh, think about it being a, um, a prescription drug situation, as opposed to just uh, the, you know, sort of like a, like a cocaine is the idea of like, you guys in Texas are great. But wait a second. It's like, it's like, nice. That is a gorgeous gown you have. And I'm looking from a distance, but wait, oh wait, there's a piece of lint. And then I obsess about the piece of lint, like that aspect of it. The idea where he's like, you guys in Texas are great, right? Which is like sort of the most like banal. Right. Like, hey! Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're like, but wait, something just fired in my brain. There is actually a problem in Texas and I, I, am, comp I, am, I am compelled to bring it up. And so, and then I actually, let me re, uh, re, uh, let me just recalculate. You're actually top 25. Well, actually, no, it's, it's top 23. It's top 23. Uh, and part of the reason, and you know, like there's, there's that quality of obsessiveness that I think you get from that type of uh, Adderall. Keep rolling it from I mean, where you get it was. It right? from, I, that's like the, that's the, the, what people say about people late night, like I'm going to come up with a business plan, like doing Coke with their friends. I just don't, I think this guy's too much of wanting to be Patrick Bateman. I don't think he's doing the, the Adderall stuff. I think he wants the pure cocaine. I don't know. Let's play. He's led the charge. Well, till about like a couple months ago, and then Austin sort of took over. Like, I don't know, guys. Like, Texas was leading the chart. You're still top 25. But we got to work on that stuff because those people have lost their minds. <laughs> I should know. Right? Yeah. All right. Please clap. The People's Republic of California is wonderful. But, you know, honestly, when I look around and I go around the country, I actually see that even in places like that, people are starting to get it. Right? They've been watching. They've seen what's going on. For a while, they believed the narrative because, you know, journalism was an honorable institution. Now they are propagandists. His, his nothing more, nothing less. You look no further than the last four years to watch how they've diminished literally all of their credibility, jumping on. People are starting to get it in California, but when they move to Austin, then they all of a sudden don't get it again. They don't get they it again. This is the, this is like Dave Rubin talking point, right? Remember what Dave exactly. Rubin? Does anybody remember like four years ago where Dave Rubin was like, "I think it's happening. I think Dem exit is happening. It is happening. It is on. People get it. I, there's people are getting it." Now he moved to the Dave Rubin sweepstakes because like, yeah, I'm not going to do Texas because Joe Rogan did that and all of the liberals are there. But hey, I got my eye on you, Nashville, or whoa, DeSantis in Florida. If you want, like, nobody cares if you're <laughs> Dave Rubin sweepstakes. Right? Yeah, he's right. like, it's like, he's like Amazon throwing... HQ. He's teasing it for many, many years, and in the end, yeah, no one's going to give you a tax break to come there, buddy. I'm just going to, I don't know, maybe I'll sell my house. I'm Didn't upping the bidding it. war for Dave Rubin services. Train boy, I turned 30 on Saturday. Can I start a, and I start a new job tomorrow? Can I please have a shofar? Yes. Very happy that you're healthy. Congrats. Train boy. Let's go to the phones. Call from a 702 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 702, just hang on for one second. We're about to turn up uh, Sam's computer. There you are. 
Yes. Yes. Hey, hey Sam. It's Bro Flamingo from Las Vegas. Bro Flamingo from Las Vegas. How are you, sir? What's on your mind? I'm all right, everybody. What's going on, Emma? What's going on, Matt? Um, What's up, Bro Flamingo? Well, hey, Emma. I was going to say, uh, regarding regarding the CPAC, I watched I only watched Trump's part. Don Jr. being coked up, I mean, it is what it is. Everybody knows what that's, what that's about. But I feel like uh, with Donald Trump, he's, like, missing a step. Or maybe, like, the juice isn't there. Or maybe, like, Trumpism is just, you know, suffused to the party. So, like, you know, him going on about like, on, on tangents about the greatest hits and, you know, Rudy and stuff like that, you really have to be really invested. I felt like, you know, the charisma and the juice wasn't there during his speech. I don't know. I just feel like he, he was very low energy. I mean, he was on Uppers, too. I was telling him that you could tell uh, <laughs> yeah. on Uppers. But it was still, he was still very low energy, still kind of struggling to, to hit those punchlines. And, like, like, Sam, to your point, you said something along the lines like, I think with Andrew Dice Clay, like you have to be so invested in, in into what he's talking about, like to really like you know get the full get the, get the full meaning of it. It was very low energy. I mean, I don't know. I, I think don't get me wrong. I think he might be. I think he might be a problem during 2022, but 2024, I, I think he might be toast, unless unless something dramatic happens. And then the one last thing I want to say um, before I, before I hop off is um. I feel like you know because I was reading I was reading the New Republic and. You know, shout out to the New Republic because they were talking about, you know, Glenn Greenwald and Tucker's, you know, marriage of convenience. And, you know, they're talking about voting rights. And I feel like, you know, there's just, like, just a sect of the left. I keep seeing it and they, they keep coming, you know, it, there just seems to be this part of the left, Sam, and everybody that wants to create these esoteric fault lines on foreign policy, especially concerning Syria. I, I, I Like, and it's weird to me because, listen, I get it, like... If I'm talking to you guys, we're in the top 10 percent of people who know about this stuff. But if we're trying to convert people and create a grassroots movement and like a labor coalition, you know, ranting about Syria or, you know, going on about it as like a as like a purity test, that does nothing for anybody. And I'm not going to mention any of the names. I'm sure you guys know about it. But yeah. I just realized like this. Can you hear me? Yeah. No, no. I I, oh. I will say this. Um, I um, putting aside the the question of of involvement in Syria as a purity test that's not even what this is i mean i can tell you that right now that of all the people that you could be possibly contemplating um i am quite confident that i was the only one on national television uh in 2011 saying week in week out uh mostly on Dylan Radigan's show at the time i think we should not get involved in Syria, regardless. Regardless of how uh, horrific Assad is or what's happening there, we should not get involved in Syria. There should be no U.S. involvement in Syria. Um, I was on national television when Trump did it. I was on national television when Obama was contemplating it, maybe doing it secretly, clandestinely. Um, and... The idea that that does not suffice as that one needs to, you know, um, uh, be read in on and have uh, encyclopedic knowledge of the uh, OPCW and assess whether uh, right. the whistleblower is legit or not. That narrowness is um, some type of bizarre fetishization. I mean, I, I'm not right. also, I, like, I, 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 we're like, a part of some project that we're not aware of because I mean, I, it's yeah, and it has gotten a lot of their fan of, of fans to to back. Yeah, it. it's just I mean, like I'm saying it, that's a possibility. I have yeah, no who idea. knows? Yeah, I but, mean, the, the the fact of the matter is is that you know um, there were clearly issues um, uh, with that, that but I, I don't know that any of that is uh, is settled in my mind, at least not in my mind. Um, right. I was, I was going to say this. I was going to say this to them, Sam, and I'll jump because I don't want to take up too much Two Just two key takeaways I see from this kind of, like, to your point, the fetishization is that, one, there's just, there's like, this crazy, like, mental gymnastics, guys, where, you know, oh, if, if you don't believe that, you know, this was a false flag or, you know, you're just a State Department shell, and, you know, it's almost like you have to do these mental gymnastics to be on the side of, like, China, Syria, and all these other... Also, you're seeing this in Afghanistan, by the way. These people are like, oh, my God, you think it's... You know, you don't, you don't think China's gonna is gonna go in, is gonna go in and fill the power vacuum? That's just geopolitics. That that's not even like you know that's not even like pro or against uh, you know America. And the second thing that's really pernicious, Sam, is that what I'm noticing is that 
they, they use, again, when I say esoteric, I, I, uh, esoteric foreign policy distinctions is that they, they use that as a, as a jumping off point to be just anti-establishment and, you know, forget electoral politics and forget voting rights and forget all this other stuff. It, it, it's like it's almost like a two for one where, where it's like not only are you just taking the dumbest take you can, it's also just it's leading to the disempowerment and stupidity and, and not thinking about these things in nuance. And frankly, some of this, some of this stuff is complicated, you know, so it, it, it's having a really deleterious effect. On uh, on uh, I think I feel like on leftist politics and leading us down crazy rabbit holes. Love you guys, leftist best. Appreciate yeah, the call. Best. The, Thanks. The reason it's being uh, pre- presented as not complicated is because RussiaGate isn't hidden as hard for some of those people. Right, right. right. I mean, yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> they milked they milk that entirely. You said you would go on the show, The Vanguard. Glenn was just on it and reminded me that you guys were going to debate. Who was I going to debate? Uh, did they reach out to you guys? I, I haven't heard from the the Vanguard. Have you guys heard from the Vanguard? Um, you know, I, I I'm I, I can't do it immediately, but uh, just about everybody who reaches out to us, I, I do. I mean, uh, let's go to the phones. Call them from a four hundred five area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, I'm Gregory from Oklahoma. Gregory from Oklahoma, how are you? I've been all right. How have you been, Sam? Good. Long time no uh, hear from. I know. Uh, I wanted to call and talk to you about two things. Uh, the first thing is, I don't know if I've called since I started substitute teaching. I've been substitute teaching for almost like two years. Wow. Um, whenever I tell the kids about famous people I know. I tell them that I know you because you're Hugo from Bob's Burgers and they think that that's really cool. So like, thank you for allowing me to know you by calling into the show. Well, (laughs) uh, it's, it's my honor. I appreciate it. Um, and, um, happy to help in that regard. All right. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk to you about is I am running for state representative in Oklahoma. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah, um, it's in a speech that's currently held by a Republican. Uh, he's been there for, this is his third term. Um, he's not great. Um, he It's kind of a, a flippable seat. Um, two Democrats that ran in 2016 and 2018, they got 44% and 43% respectively against them. So it's very much doable. Um, I'm getting started really early. I'm currently fundraising. Um, the link to my fundraiser is on my Twitter page. It's pinned to my profile. Um, we got it up on Gregory. the screen right now. Okay. Um, there you go. Um, if y'all, anyone else has any questions, they can DM me and ask anything. Um, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Well, Gregory, thanks for calling in and updating us, and keep us updated, too. I will. Thanks, Thanks, Gregory. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good stuff. I love it. You know how happy I'd be if Gregory knocks off a Republican? (laughs) (laughs) That would be pretty good. That would be pretty good. Uh, That would be pretty good. All right, let's go. Calling from a 210 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, 210. Oh, hi. This is uh, TLL. Uh, just give me one second. I'm going to go to the car. I'm at work and I'm five seconds away. Okay. Usually when you pull a 210, I think it's uh, you answering John from San Antonio. <laughs> Wait. Oh, I, I can't, can't hear you. Hey, sorry. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I am at work. Uh, you guys get me through work on the... On the job doing pools every day. My name is TLL. I go by TLL right now from San Antonio. TLL, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks, man. Um, I usually get a little nervous when I call it, but uh, anyway, I love you guys and uh, you guys really get through a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, it was, um, I don't know where to start. I've just kind of, I'm having a little scary uh, issue, and um, I, I'll start off by saying um, I'm one of these um, silly young, not silly, but, you know, young, invincible types, you know, under 30, but can vote. Apparently that's the definition. And um, I guess that that term applies when it comes to health care. 
it's just it's just I'm kind of I'm kind of you know I'm the type of person I've had some financial issues I started with this job a few years ago and I kind of went broke just adjusting to a new income um, for a little bit and um, following that um, I've been a little afraid to basically apply for health insurance um, but uh, now I'm kind of now I'm kind of yeah I appreciate that but now I'm kind of at the point where um, I may be having like a, a hernia developing and uh, that's why I've got my name kind of um, I'll call him with my name another time. I'm not that afraid. I'm kind okay. of hoping to be a streamer at some point. But um, just it's – and, you know, I had one friend diagnosed with cancer recently, and they have health care and these other things, and they've still got the um, – they've still got open enrollment, I guess, going on with in August 15th. I promise I have a point in a second. Um, they've got uh, open enrollment going on up to August 15 with the ACA. So hopefully I can get with that and uh, reconcile everything and then get on work next year. So uh, I can get this thing to take care of sooner than later. But um, I mean, it's just, it's just a shock. Like it all, it all happened. It happened when I was driving home for my dad last night, about two and a half hour. And it really came onto me as I was driving. And, and then I was sitting and listening to you guys this morning for that great interview um, that was, you know, health related to, women's issues and it's just i really i really it's you know you have that point she said you know men tend i guess tend to um speak more straightforward and descriptively about their health issues and you know it can be harder to describe that just empathetically and and descriptively as a woman from what it was kind of being told and it's just you know having all of this having all of this all of a sudden go on right now and um um trying to do a physical job and try to get uh, health insurance on short notice is a little scary. And, you know, I just, I, I, I feel like it's, it's such a more daunting task for women, which is so important and frustrating because, you know, not only is there not um, proper health care provided, but, you know, when there's that type of investment in, in, you know, broad scale health care, you know, um, you get a lot more, um, diversity of opinions that matter to people and um, really key, really bring, you know, greater outcomes for society. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I don't know. It's, it's just horrible and I'm kind of frustrated, but you know, honestly, you guys have gotten me through. I, I started listening to the show um, shortly after um, 2017 about the election. Uh-huh. And uh, the first clip I saw of you guys was, um, the Bill O'Reilly clip. You guys were doing Bill O'Reilly it was short, shortly before the, the the New York inauguration, as he said when he was drunk. And um, the uh, what did he say? Oh yeah, Andrea Bocelli and uh, <laughs> oh uh, country gosh. singer Garth Bruce. <laughs> and uh, these are the people who are victims of the reverse McCarthyism, which is now you know cancel culture or whatever the hell it is these days. Um, so I guess that's how far I go back. I'll call in another time and I, I'll probably be, I'd be good because I, I, I like watching a lot of you guys' YouTube clips and it'd be good to, uh, uh, get you guys to rem- reminisce about it in the future. So I'll be calling back in the future, but okay, I great. just want to say, you know, you guys did a lot for, thanks, thanks for hearing and listening to me today. And it, it did a lot of me. I love you guys and I'm going to keep listening forever. So All thank right. you very much. Thanks DLL. And, and, and do look into, uh, the ACA, uh, right now because, um, from a from a a public policy perspective, our healthcare system is uh, super messed up. Obviously, I mean, in terms of like um, providing universality, single payer, providing specific benefits. But with that said, right now is also a good time if you've been unemployed. If you've taken unemployment at any time uh, recently, you can get you 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 are eligible for free health care at least for a while going forward. Uh, the Cobra stuff is about to, um, I think, is about to end. But um, we can put up a link to this. The American Rescue Plan lowers health insurance costs for Americans who may have lost their job, so it can become too close to free or a very low. Uh, a uh, low fee, but, um, and, uh, so I, 
not necessarily the best way to deliver it, but it's for the time being um, a good situation. Um, plus, according to Jelaya, if uh, he got the hernia while working, he can have his medical bills covered by workers' compensation as well as lost wages. Um, so uh, check that out. All right, let's take uh, one more call, and then we'll go back to some clips. Call from a 519 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's Sandy from Ontario. Sandy from Ontario. How are you? I'm great. How are all you guys? Oh, pretty, we're good. pretty good. Fine. Yeah, that's good. Um, I've been trying to get through for a while, and I was on hold the other day when Lance from the Surf called in. And it was so weird because he was actually talking about the two same things I wanted to talk about. Oh, Lance. Sam Cedar Body Pills, number one home warming gift here in Ontario. Sam Cedar Body Pills? Body Pillow. Yeah. A body Pillow? What is that? Yeah, they're the number one housewarming gift. It's like a... Here in Ontario. It's like a, like a blow-up doll, but you just cuddle with it instead. Oh. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, of course. Very popular here. <laughs> I also wanted to build on the my conversation. I just told myself, and uh, <laughs> then I go to sleep that way. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to build on the conversation about the residential schools up here in Canada. Okay. So, uh, yeah. so the last one closed in 1996, but that wasn't the end of the like child kidnapping of Indigenous peoples. Because it's then switched over to like the child welfare program. And here in Ontario, in one five year period alone, over 100 Indigenous children died in that program. Mm. So just because the residential schools closed doesn't mean that it ended. And there's been the NDP has been trying to make change. So they recently passed a motion to call on uh, Justin Trudeau to stop fighting survivors in court and taking Indigenous children to court court and that passed 267 to zero but there's 338 seats in parliament so all the people who abstained were liberals and justin trudeau didn't even bother to show up to that vote so it's far from being over and justin trudeau's not going to do anything about it he puts on a good show but the reality is the kamloops school the last 10 years that it was running the prime minister of the country was Justin's dad. So he's not oh, too no, eager to start know. investigations and looking into it. Right. Because I hadn't thought his, about that. His dad yeah. was prime minister. Yeah. His dad was prime minister. So any real investigation, you know, it could implement him. Right. Could, could tar his, his father's legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know not that Deb Holland still... has started a. I don't know if it's analogous, but a, an assessment in this country, uh, the Department of Interior is looking at at our, you know, mm -hmm. our records here too. I have a feeling we're going to find some uh, horrible, horrible history. It, yeah, if you look yeah, at the American probably, Indian movement that came in the '70s, like a lot of those figures had stories of traumatic abuse at American boarding schools. Yeah, I mean, uh, almost impossible to imagine mm -hmm. it wasn't the case. Yeah, um, like I know up here, if you pay attention to the news, it's the way the government and the media kind of tints um, what they're saying. Because in one news report, it was $27 million was, uh, Justin Trudeau was giving $27 million to help with searches. But what needs to be pointed out is that $27 million was already set aside for years and years for that purpose. He just finally released that amount. Mm. So a lot of people think that, you know, he's doing a good job, and yet he said, okay, I'll promise to get clean drinking water to all Indigenous communities in another five years, breaking his previous promise of getting that done in his first term. And so there's dozens of Indigenous communities that have been without clean drinking water for decades, like lifetimes of it. Yeah, it would be interesting to do, like to do an assessment of just how much like Donald Trump helped people like Trudeau, <laughs> you know, get away with like, um, sort of 
I don't know, uh, that uh, the existence of Donald Trump didn't sort of like give license for people like Trudeau to get away with a lot of stuff. He was massively helpful to the reactionary center, um, or moderate liberals sort of people, just absolute gift to them. That's why Pelosi was fundraising him the entire time. The, the yep. kids in cages stuff like that was, and that was clear before he, uh, won the election in 2016, I think. Yeah. Macron too. Yes. I would imagine mm -hmm. anybody who was like, look at, look at this guy He's squeezing Donald Trump's hand. Uh, <laughs> I mean, how much, how, the, how much no, pipeline nonsense, how many pipelines has Trudeau mm -hmm. approved in his, in his tenure? And especially, I feel like we talked about it less, as, as Sam said, in the past four years. Yeah, well, he spent billions, like $4.5 billion on one alone. Yeah. And, like, recently in the past year, <clears throat> he spent a quarter of a trillion dollars bailing out banks. And yet he still says, where's the money for the clean water? Where's the money for searching the grounds of residential schools? We have the money. He's just not using it appropriately. Well, appreciate the, the update, Sandy. Yeah. Well, and if people can check out my YouTube channel, that would be fantastic. I try to cover issues like this when I can, uh, as well as other Canadian politic issues that people love to ignore. <laughs> Give give the uh, uh, give the, the URL. Box. Yeah, left of the box. Left of the box on, on YouTube. Appreciate yeah. the call, Sandy. So if people could check that out, that'd be great. Thank you so much. You guys rock. YouTube.com you slash left of the box. Um, let's go back and see what else we got at uh, CPAC, right? In terms of uh, lunacy. Oh well, no, let's check in on this. Okay. Speaking of. Do you remember Walter Schaub? Schaub, am I pronouncing his name correctly? He was the ethics guy who early on in the Trump administration got um, got fired. I, I don't even know if they rehired anybody. I don't even remember the the ethics head. I don't know if the, they they made Laura, you know, one, one of the one of the Trump uh, and maybe it was in laws Ivanka Trump's who uh, knows responsibilities. But um, here's Walter Schaub. And this is a real problem with uh, with Hunter and 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 I, Hunter uh, Biden. You know, I'm a father. I, I it's not hard for me to imagine that my son might be a little bit problematic when I grow older. And you want to do everything you can to help your son, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the best thing you could do, it seems to me, if you're at the White House, is to just stay away. Like, don't, like, I don't know, don't get involved in any type of plans for what people are buying, you know, with this. Like, I don't know, you know, that's the only way it seems to me that you can win. But the, the plan that they seem to have come up with, Hunter uh, Biden has decided to paint. And apparently people are very excited about his paintings. Um, here is Walter Schaub. This is Obama's former ethics chief um, on CNN with Victor Blackwell talking about this Biden attempt to, um, I guess, put a firewall between Hunter Biden and the White House and and hopefully not allow people buying his paint paintings as like bribes. Uh, Shab is the former head of the Office of Government Ethics under President Obama. Uh, Walter, thanks for being with us. So some of those safeguards uh, put in place are neither Hunter Biden nor the public will know who bid on or purchased the work. And if there's unusual behavior like the offer being too high, the collector doesn't appear to be interested, the gallery is expected to turn down the offer. You don't think that's enough. Why? No, I mean, they have outsourced government ethics to an art dealer. She mentioned industry standards. It's an industry that's notorious for money laundering. There's no standards in that industry. And the idea that they're going to flag any overly priced offers, well, this is art that hasn't even been juried into a community art sale. How is How are they going to decide what's unreasonable when they've already priced it in the range of 75000 to 500000 for a first outing? This is just preposterous and very disappointing. And Walter, just explain why would the White House be the intermediary 
for the art sale. I mean, I think that what Jen Psaki was saying was that they thought that this would be a way to head off any ethical concerns, but you're shaking your head. Yeah, they've absolutely made it worse for two reasons. One, what they've done is ensured that neither you nor I nor anyone watching this show will know who buys the art unless they share it publicly. But there's nothing that we can do to monitor to make sure that Hunter Biden or anyone in the White House doesn't find out that the dealer keeps his or her promise, that the buyers don't uh, call the White House, ask for a meeting and say, hey, I just bought the president's son's art for $500,000. Now, maybe we trust Joe Biden not to give preferential treatment because he's a better human being than Donald Trump. But you don't run an ethics program on the idea that you hope everybody behaves. If everybody in the world would behave, we don't even need laws prohibiting murder then. So, Walter, let's look at it from this perspective. And, and art is subjective, right? The appreciation of these pieces. But they're not bad, right? If you look at them, these are things that some collectors might like. Um, is there a way that Hunter Biden could now become this great emerging artist and sell them for a price that matches the market that would not run afoul of, of ethics concerns? Well, the thing is, it's just got the absolute appearance that he's profiting off of his father's fame. He's not selling under a pseudonym. He's not waiting till his father is out of office. And he's not selling at any price comparable to what other first-time artists are selling. So the White House should have first made its move to have the president try to talk him out of doing this. And if that failed, they should have gone the opposite direction and asked that the name of buyers be released and pledged to the American people that what they would do is let us know any time one of those buyers got a meeting with an administration official so that the public could judge whether or not they were getting preferential treatment. The problem is now they've set a precedent for the next president. And even if you happen to trust Joe Biden, what if the next president has the character of a Donald Trump? This would be a perfect mechanism for funneling bribes to that president. Oh, it's so true. Because first, like, Wait, wait. First off, let me just say yeah, this. Yeah. The chances of us ever getting a president with the character of Donald Trump, that's absurd. How could that ever happen? I know. Not following Joe Biden. Well, I, he's restored the soul of America by uh, setting up some mechanisms soul for restored. to be the intermediary. We don't have to worry about this at all. Yeah, as long as he's completed the soul restoration just by existing as president. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And then no, I, I, I mean take... it's just one like I, I I get so conflicted about Hunter Biden stuff because I genuinely feel bad for the guy, <laughs> and I feel like this whole server. Uh, like drip 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 by daily mail and new york post is unconscionable and ridiculous and i feel like a lot of what biden's doing here is trying to create some way for his son to feel like he has purpose um but obviously it's an issue because you don't need to be involved in this he could as they say do it under a pseudonym he could wait in four years or eight years or whenever biden's out of office Clearly, this seems like a way for him to coddle and create some sort of, you know, well, purpose for his son. And like, just like what Obama did, too, with these with these systems, you have to reform them yourself because there will be another Republican and the Republicans are bad and they will exploit them to this very extent. So I, I mean, I have on one hand. I have uh, my guess is Joe Biden doesn't like to tell Hunter, don't do something. That's, and I don't know that true. he has the ability to do it uh, I, either to tell Hunter, like, don't do this. But you listen to those that those audio conversations or the transcripts of those conversations. You know, Joe Biden remembers them as kids when the, the you know, their mother was was dead and, and, and the sister died. And he's going to visit these kids in the hospital. But with that said, um, and I would also say Walter Schaub obviously is probably a jealous artist. Maybe yeah. he doesn't realize that part of the art installation, it's, it's mixed media. Part of it is the painting, but also part of it is the dynamic of people buying the painting and then getting access to the White House. That could be all part of like a, 
mixed media performance art yes. visual project. I mean, look, the bottom it's an line experience is experience because you get to go to the White House, meet with the president, and then get a favor in return. Wow. With all those sympathy sympathies outlined, the, the the bottom line is Joe Biden needs to come out and say, I call on the um the the art dealer to make who purchased these public and uh to and, and we will ask everybody who comes into the White House, did you buy one of these paintings? And we will publish that information. I mean, that's the only thing that really the president can do, right? They can't order, you can't order the kid not to sell his art for exorbitant money that of course people are buying because of the name. Look, this is a problem throughout American society. I've got some bad news for people. Meghan McCain is not talented. <laughs> And even though she ended up on The View, it's not because she was that talented. Well, With I all mean, do respect. Or a Lin Manuel Miranda. I also don't think. <laughs> <it's a talented. laughs> or Abby Huntsman. There's been three daughters on The View. <laughs> oh God. Uh, or Alicia Menendez. Alicia Menendez. I mean, look. The bottom line is, is that like this is. And I've got some bad news about every, uh, just about every actor or actress that you like. Guess what? Their parents were famous. It's just that they've changed their last name so that the only people who know that they're their they're kids uh, were the casting agents who were super psyched to have like, oh my God, it's Uma Thurma's kid in here or whatever it is. And, uh, and, and so there is, and then, you know, I mean, this is a problem in American society and the president has to do everything he can, despite the fact that obviously he feels bad for his kid um, f 50 years later or whatever. I mean, I can understand that dynamic, but you've got to come out and you've got to protect the institution of the presidency and you've got to protect the integrity of the government. And, the, you know, you got to take every step possible to do that. Everything else is just BS. Well, I... <laughs> It's more than than just the accident. The, the the guys, you know, been in near death situations with drugs like many many times. Clearly, right. he has issues. But the point too is that Biden. This isn't the first time he set up an unethical framework for his son Hunter. I mean, to the, rake in huge amounts of cash. Right, and the, I mean the Barisma oil dealing, the 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 board seat that he had, where he was paid tens of thousands of dollars to do dick. Uh, that was corrupt, and that was the one thing Republicans had on this story that was actually substantive. Um, and now they have a second. Uh, well, uh, I will say this. Every board of directors is corrupt. And it just absolutely. so happens, whatever happens to be the hook, you know, it's like, let's set up the board of directors. Let's get a politician's son, uh, kid. Yeah. That's, we got one slot for that. Let's get a former military personnel. We got a slot for that. Let's get somebody who worked at Citibank. We got a slot for that. And then they just go, they don't do anything. Then they just get paid a tremendous amount of money. The whole thing is freaking corrupt. Um, but, you know, and, and do I blame Hunter for going and cashing in? Of course he's like, his father could call him up and say, Hunter, I really would prefer you don't do this. Well, dad, I guess what? Uh, do you have $4 million you're going to give me? Because right now I can go sell my crappy paintings and I'm going to get $4 million for it. And I got news for you. The day you leave office, I ain't getting a dollar. So, uh, I mean, maybe that's an exaggeration, but it, maybe I'm like, I'm only going to get 10,000 a painting, not 500,000. So Hunter is like, I'm making bank now. And so the White House has to do everything they can to say, we're going to ask a question of you when you come to see us. And one of those questions is, have you ever done any business with any member of the, of the Biden family? Have you ever bought a painting? of anything produced, any, you know, like come up with like a five part questionnaire that could actually be a template. And we're, and this automatically gets released. It's like, uh, you know, it's like VARES or whatever it is. Like it's all raw data. You could do that. And they should do that because, you know, there, there's an issue here, but you know, I, I, the, when you get to that, there, there's also just, I think, a, a narcissism that yeah. is like, I, I'm bigger than the office and, yeah. and therefore, you know, I got to worry about my kid. Well, yeah, I get that. But if you're really that worried, maybe you don't run for president. I want to say shout out to Walter yeah. Schaub for having the same energy during the Biden administration that he had during the Trump. Uh, I like to yes. say that. 
Um, and I also, it is, it's just so, because of course everyone can relate to, if parents can relate to like wanting to help their kid out, but people can't relate to this idea where like a rich kid launders their privilege into purpose via an art studio. Like that is, it's so stereotypical. It's so like, like moving to New York, I remember going to a party where it was somebody who had a play coming out and it's like, oh, cool, we need a playwright. And it's just, it's at a house that they inherited a very, like, oh, this is who gets to write the plays. Right. This is who gets to be in the art studios. It's all just people looking for purpose because they don't have to work. It is, a pr- as a you say, it's a privilege to be able to look for purpose. I guess, you know, I don't know. I, I like in reading some of that stuff that was leaked about Hunter Biden, it seems like he's a person in a lot of pain. So I have sympathy for that. But at this, yeah, I mean, those paintings are not bad. Yeah. And, 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 and it would be a great conversation piece. But sell them without the Biden name, maybe. Yes, like, there you, you go. Figure out how to. Well, but, but, I mean, come on. Let's be honest here, right? Like, um, now, I'm not, I'm in the market for art that is over, uh, you know, three figures. Well, let's put it that way. But, um, but, you know, $900? Would I, would I spend $900 on that painting and be able to say, like, that's Hunter Biden did that. I mean, that's why you buy it. I'm right, sorry. Right. Like, I mean, frankly, the, that's a street. If you saw that on the street, like a vendor, a vendor put that painting out, what would you pay for it? One of those paintings. Uh, I, I could see uh, buying it for a couple hundred bucks. I could. I mean, if I really liked it, I'm not, I, I haven't looked I at it. I'm very know what the, who the f- I, I, don't, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't have, but, I, the, the problem but is my like, point is, is you buy is. art in and of itself. I mean, a big portion of art sales, let's face it, is just built upon like some measure of hype. Oh my god! And, and so and and it's like, <laughs> I sold art in Maine when I was a college student at a gallery, and the art was, and I'm not proud of this. The art was. Um, was like manufactured art, like I think um, in Korea maybe, and it's like a conveyor belt, and they take um, they take they take uh, the phone book, and they pick out New England names, and they sign it, and then there's like a, you know, you've seen like they sell this like sometimes like um, at in New Jersey they'll sell it at hotels and stuff like these oil paintings, and there's like an insert of a captain's head, you know, over a beach scene. Right. And um, pop art. Yeah, it, it, it's a pop up art stores. Yeah. And uh, I I was selling it on commission and uh, it wasn't the stuff wasn't moving. And the guy's like, look, you got to come up with a story for these. And so each one I had a story about. Yeah. Morgan. Yeah. That's that's his grandfather who was lost at sea. And uh, and. That, that would move some paintings. Are I mean, you telling me that art is just mostly bullshit and it's people masturbating uh, and, 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 well, like it's masturbatory a little bit? That's a different type of art. But, well, uh, but, okay, well. No, but, uh, but I'm saying that, that like. might be Hunter Biden's People art. like a story behind their, uh, you know, and, and uh, often. I mean, there are other people like, this goes with my couch. I'll take it. Um, but it's way more interesting if there is a story. I just don't think the Hunter Biden story is all that great because, like, there's some not. sympathetic stuff with him. But there's also, like. You know, I somebody should paint like his text messages with his cousin that are very absolutely <laughs> sell that. Wait, I didn't see that. There's so well, you might want to Google that because uh, yeah, a lot less. Important. I'm not making the case he's a compelling person. I'm making the case that like I I feel sympathy for him. Yeah, I mean, lastly, I would just say I hope that some right winger buys a bunch of the the Biden paintings just as like an own to the libs. That would be pretty funny. Yeah, and then be like, wait, why did I just do that? Calling from an 832 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 832. I hear you. I hear you breathing. Oh, it's, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> hey, sorry. I uh, was listening but not paying attention. Uh, hey, thanks for taking my call. My name is Rami from Atlanta. Rami from Atlanta. What's on your mind? So, uh, I, I've been listening to for a while. I actually feel compelled to call based on uh, Ayn Rand last week on Wednesday. Yes. Uh, so I'm a fifth year PhD student at Georgia State University in nutrition science. And 
I had some uh, comments about some of the ludicrous statements he was saying about research and research funding as well as the FDA. Yeah, please do. I mean, it was there was both alternatively the the government doesn't do any uh, real research. It fails all the time. And uh, also uh, something like the, the government doesn't really do any research, but it also crowds out all the research. <laughs> right. I mean, there's just things that got me heated. Um, so in our lab's case, for example, most of our funding comes from, you know, the USDA, for example, so all government funded. Um, but two major points I'm going to bring up, uh, the main one is regarding the decision maker and in regards to funding of research as well as drug approval. You know, it's not a bunch of congressmen or bureaucrats making this decision. It's a panel of scientific experts in the respective field coming to consensus on whether funding should be granted for a study or whether a drug should be approved because he was saying it should be in the hands of the scientists when it in fact is in the hands of the scientists. So this is just a complete misunderstanding of the process. Yes, of course. But anytime the government, anytime you, the, the every, anytime the government hires scientists, they, it somehow taints them with government juice on them or something as if they're, right. I mean, like, you know, they got a handout. Well, well, you know, in funding for, or in like, you know, grant funding, for example, it's not, they're not even hired. It's just volunteers. So for example, my professor's on a panel for uh, USDA to approve for those, those grants. Um, and she's not, you know, paid by the USDA. It's just it's more for like a resume building type thing and for prestige. All right, but um, she has the inside track if the USDA ever hires. <laughs> right. Well, you know, that's, I guess, uh, depends on the career goal. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, her, I'm her being a little bit facetious. Yes, but go ahead. Right. Uh, so the second major point, which I thought was pretty dangerous and insidious, is the statement that uh, university research should not be government funded, which is very dangerous to me. So it's a well-known fact that private industry funded, funded studies are highly prone to bias. And for example, nutrition science studies funded by uh, private industry are four to eight times more likely to have favorable conclusions of the sponsor versus uh, studies funded by uh, not private industry. What? Right. Are you telling me, are you telling me that a company that has millions, if not billions of dollars at stake for the outcome of a research grant, that that, 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 and that the money that they would give to researchers at a university, knowing that that's what they want as the outcome, are you telling me that would influence what was going on? I mean, if that were the case, then we wouldn't have found out that, uh, let's say, cigarettes cause cancer for years. Right, right. Definitely the case there. What? I mean, it took decades That's to crazy. Get rid of that. what? <laughs> but, but surely, but surely, sugar is good for us. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's a lot of, you know, seeds of doubt that, uh, that occur, in, especially in private industry funding uh, studies. Yeah. But, no, I mean, you know, if this were the case, I mean, it introduced major bias and the trust in the process to be like, totally deteriorated. It is, I will, I will say this, and I thought Yaron was a very nice guy. Um, I am mystified by how I could have a conversation with somebody who has been in a leadership position of the Ayn Rand Institute for two decades and they don't have any retort to what you're saying that isn't based upon just sort of vague notion of like government icky well, why right. is government icky just because it's government -y. like corporations are just made of people but government that's made of something else. <laughs> so it's a bureaucracy. They're like, they're not, right. they're not human. Like, like, I mean, talk about bureaucracy. Like, I, I mean, with all due respect, I licensed this, sh uh, the first half of the show to a very large corporation. And I will tell you something. It is, there are moments where I'm just amazed that like the world doesn't cave in on itself when I look at how complicated some of the most basic functions are. And yeah. to argue that somehow government is fundamentally different. Yes, 
government is fundamentally different in ways that would make it you want it to be the exclusive purview of research like they don't have a profit motive like if you want research and you want to just find out what happens if you just study this without the funding being um uh, uh re without your funding being reliant on a certain outcome i mean government should be almost the only uh, uh arena for research at that point no i agree 100 percent and all the biggest you know discoveries have been built on government funded research because you know, he was saying for example that most of the studies that come out of university are junk studies with only a few like coming out of the public eye that are of headline worthy news i mean this is this is ridiculous because those headline articles are not what drive scientific discovery they're built on the backs of complex mechanistic studies which no private industry have any interest in funding and you know uh, and they're not necessarily those findings are not necessarily interesting to lay people but highly relevant scientists in the field in terms of building upon that science and you know coming to those much greater discoveries and and, and i would also add that like i've had I, I i can't remember in what context but i i met a medical vc venture capitalist and um i had no idea about this but like if anything there's a massive argument for just like like a, a huge increase in in government research grants and de and development because this vc was like yeah no we, we came across a uh what what appeared to be a cure for this or a cure for that or a treatment for this and for that and i'm like what happened yeah no we just didn't think we could get like a hundred x uh return on that why well, and so wait what happened to those things yeah, I don't know. The guy just went away and they didn't make any money and just moved on to the next thing. I, I did an interview for the second hour of on the, on uh, Peacock with a journalist who covered this in the LA Times where essentially the government had funded or had given money to this bio research firm that successfully found um, a cure via stem cells for this rare genetic disease for young kids and essentially because they found that it wasn't profitable to manufacture or to go to step number two even though it saved this girl from dying uh, and could save more kids they had to stop because there's no preconditions on the money that's given by the government to some of these yeah, research but, uh, oh. but you could also just cut out the middleman and <laughs> when there's no profit motive the government could do it itself exactly Right. It would be very dystopian. And I mean, there'd be no trust in, in scientific findings. What's that? If um, if what? If, if, if you know, if, if every if research is profit driven, if it was purely, of course, uh, yeah. private industry, you know, that, you know, what would be the I mean, scientific discovery would be based purely on driving some product. Right. It's the development. It, I mean, if anything right now, the, the problem is the development. The development is skewed towards things that are going to be necessarily profitable. And, and, and I want to be clear, that does not necessarily mean that they are uh, that that the idea that profitability is uh, has a one to one relationship with what pr uh, priorities of society should be or what uh, is the most um, you know pressing needs for let's say the health of 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 humans it's just simply it's not the case mm -hmm. and that's the no only thing definitely can... not right and i mean my research is looking at plant-based diets and such and there's no you know profit motive to eat more plants for example so there's also no, a... <laughs> there's very not enough profit motive in preventative care too what have you found about the the plant-based diets before while we have you show oh, for uh, plant <laughs> extremely effective so i'm focused mostly on cardiovascular related diseases extremely effective in reducing uh we looked at hypersensitive subjects for example and we were able to re simultaneously reduce medications and reduce blood pressure at the same time to where they're nearly realized with less medications and this is only a four-week intervention wow um yeah and you know we found effects in heart failure as well uh things doctors wouldn't believe um, this is published research. Uh, if you, you just look for my, uh, my, my, if you look for uh, on PubMed, uh, RS, jar, 
that's my first two initials, R S and then last name N H H A R. You can find all my publications. N H. What's, uh, so what's your last name? R S N A. So last name is N as in Nancy A J A R. J A R. Okay. Yeah. yeah R S. Let me tell you this. Um, you also uh, you need to get them to upgrade your uh, your uh, um, your phone too, because oh okay. my headset is it bad? Yeah. <laughs> cuts out but uh okay. really appreciate it and um all right thank you always always great to have a shill for big plant on the um wonder how much investment he has in like trees seeds. well is it a coincidence that we advertise for tree for trees fast growing trees today yeah. yeah at one point you mentioned venture capital um Libertarians particularly like to talk as if we're in this golden era for business startups, like, you know, the startups as, as a culture now. But if you actually look at data, business startups have been on a basically a straight downward trajectory since the 70s. Well, that's monopoly. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's why. And that's and monopoly. All, this obscures like what how bad like neoliberalism and monopoly has actually been for innovation. Um, I just saw an IM actually that I, I, I can't find it now. And I wanted to address that. And they were saying that I undersold uh, Biden's executive order on Friday about monopolies. And um, I did, uh, but basically for two reasons. One, I don't think he had quite signed it at that point. Um, but it is, you know, and and I want to have a guest on to, to walk us through it. But it, but it deals with um, USDA, uh, protecting farmers against um, uh, big gag. Um, it gets rid of the FT. It suggests the FTC to get rid of um, non-compete clauses. And and we should be clear, like non-compete clauses are not, you know, I think most people think like, oh, well, that's just like if you are chief engineer and you're going into Google and you're going to get all these trade secrets. We don't want you to work in, you know, for search engines in three years. Well, they're doing it for stuff like, you know, you're, you're doing like uh weight service, uh, you know, at uh, the Denny's and you can't work anywhere for 23 miles, you know, around here. We're like what? Uh, there's no other restaurants I can work at. It's stuff like that. I mean, it's really gotten bad also to modify their occupational licensing uh, requirements. Codes and regulations, and you want to make sure that, you know, certain uh, professions are licensed. But again, this is also, this is uh, also, understand, this is a state thing. States and localities do this. And often, often, not always, it is a way to protect incumbents in there. Uh, you know. I got a, um, you know, I got a, a lawn care business and, uh, you know, anybody with a zero turn mower is going to be my competition unless you need a licensing requirement, which is going to involve a uh, sum of, you know, $250,000 and, and then it becomes a, a, a way to protect the incumbent monopoly. Um, their uh, right to repair. I want to also have a right to repair person on um, where like you are um they make it hard to well they build things to make it hard to fit. like one of the things that was great about apple when it first came out is that like you could pop the thing open and fix all sorts of things when i was younger i used to fix vcrs and resell them and it ended up being just like literally more like 80 percent of the time your vcr didn't work it was because the rubber brand band was broken so I'd open it up, I'd buy a rubber band for two cents and like literally like 25 cents at the uh, Radio Shack. And then I'd close the thing back up. And I would sell it for 30 bucks. Back and, in my day. Yeah, exactly. And then I would also do the three speed bikes. Um, but now there's no Radio Shack and it's, uh, but the we're gonna have a right to repair person on too. And then they would also deal with mergers. Um, so it's a big deal, but I wanna get an expert on uh to talk about it because i think one time i did fix my computer by like looking it up on the internet and like unscrewing it myself with a little you know eyeglass screwer have the machines half the machines that we've had in this office for the most part have been like all of the laptops i i took out the second drive i upgraded it to like um uh flash drives like 
we've got machines in this office that are, are almost as you know like almost a little bit older than you emma and <laughs> um and and part of that was just a function of being able to fix those or you know make them work um but we will get more to that later we'll get back more to the machines in the office later yeah okay i hope everyone's on the edge of their seat hey folks listen let's just take a moment uh at cpac it's not just about owning the libs or showing off what the latest like um uh prescription drugs you've been abusing it's also about making people not feel so self-conscious about themselves and here is rick scott telling the cpac audience that they need to stop worrying about what other people think in terms of their racism. Is this est, but for this is bigots? Well, let's listen to the clip first. Now, in the past, Republicans have been intimidated when Democrats call us racist. But we got to stop being intimidated. We can't allow that. The Democrats know that they lose on actual policy. We win on policy, so that's when they play the race card. We can't stand down and we can't cower to the Democrats calling us names. They're gonna call us racist no matter what we do. That game has to be over. We've gotta stand up and fight for what we believe in. Fight for our conservative principles. We're gonna fight for free, fair, and secure elections. We're gonna fight for a government in Washington that doesn't represent liberal special interests, our woke corporations, our woke CEOs, our Democrat activists that want our children, teach our children that our country and our values are bad. We're going to fight for the values that make our country great because we are the greatest country in the history of the world. As I criticize Democrats, we have to stand up every day and fight for our faith, our families, and this country we love. I want to get to the broader point about what he's, he's telling them, but so if I get this right, the conservatives bring up policies and then the Democrats kill the policy discussion because they say, you're racist. Let's go over the election, the, um, the policies. Free and fair elections, okay. Fair enough. I think that's a, at least that's a, I guess that's a policy. Democrats are against that, I guess, right? Well, I mean, when it's... you count in what Rick Scott means by fair, uh, I think Democrats probably are against it. That's, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, free and fair, it means just like uh, very specific people get to vote. If only there was an, uh, an election bill in the Senate that Rick Scott could support right now. Indeed. But the other major policy was no woke, no woke stuff. Mm -mm -mm. That's a big policy. Like, um, I remember uh, reading some of the policy papers that came out of the No Woke Institute, and that stuff was pretty heavy reading. Don't do that. Don't try that late at night. No more sitting down with a glass of Chablis and uh, reading the No Woke policy statements because those are too uh, difficult to get through. I took a No Woke class at Liberty University. Um, there's, but there's also another uh, policy that he outlined. Uh, he didn't use the name critical race theory, but he said, no learning that America is bad. That mm -mm. policy, no learning that America is bad or done bad things. That's a big policy uh, prescription there. And, um, and then also, feelings. the final biggest policy was that our country's great, so our values got to be great. And when the Democrats came out with the no great values policy i was like well i don't know about this it seems a little weird and now i think they're paying the price for it i mean they, it's 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 like children it's like children but this is the thing that limbaugh did all the time too no self doubt yep. limbaugh used to like literally talk about this in the context of not just like culture but in terms of people's like own personal situations it can't allow any doubt to creep in 
And this is Rick Scott going out there saying, let's pretend like we have policies that we're offering other than we're just reacting to things culturally that we don't like. And when the Democrats say, hey, you're reacting to uh, things in our culture that you don't like, as in like black people or the fact that like people besides someone who looks just like you is getting some modicum of power within society. Um, they don't like being called out on that, but they don't, but you know, what's amazing is like, they're not, they're not even offering any policy subscription, you know, prescription. There's but, nothing. There's that's, nothing. That's exactly what you say about the filibuster or what we've talked about. I, I shouldn't just attribute it to you, please. Even though your name's on the back there. Uh, um, <laughs> but that like, there's nothing left for the Republicans to, uh, they have nothing to, to right. So the, doing away with the filibuster is essential because anything that they care about passing, they can already do through reconciliation, through tax cuts and through fiscal policy. They just want to enrich their donors and make the country better for wealthy people. Uh, everything else is just critical race theory, garbage, gobbledygook, blech. And, you know, who cares really about that anyway, except, I mean, it could, the downsides though are outweighed by the upsides of getting rid of the, of the filibuster and ensuring that insane people like rick scott don't rig the entire game in their favor which is why the for the people act is so necessary yes. i mean i can see i can imagine a world where you get rid of the filibuster and then the senate passes the no woke culture bill great uh that outline that that basically forces everybody to own those uh dr seuss books that were uh, pulled by the publisher and you have to own one lib a day <laughs> and if and maybe one more if you're a real patriot um let's to visit in on christy gnome let's see what she's saying at cpac this is also bat crap crazy remember christy gnome rented out her national guard to a billionaire who um, apparently wanted to send people to the, where does that billionaire live or where doesn't he live? He's in Tennessee. Now, how far along the border, how much of Tennessee's uh, border uh, borders with Mexico? I'm not quite clear on that. None, but it does border the most other states around it. Go off on piece of trivia, Tennessee. Interesting. But not one of those states uh, is South Dakota, right? That's it. Yeah. Okay. Let's just be clear. So Tennessee does not border South Dakota and doesn't border Mexico and doesn't border Mexico. So to be clear, the story is, this is a story of a billionaire living in Tennessee who rented a, uh, a national guard from South Dakota to station itself somewhere near the border, I guess in Texas. And like, um, I, I really wonder, like, what, like, when, the, like, the border patrol is like, um, what are you guys doing here? Here's Christy Nome announcing that she did this dumbness at uh, CPAC. Number two, the second most dangerous thing that's happening is down at our southern border. A nation without borders is a nation without laws and is not a nation at all. So here's what I want to explain something to you. I was the very first governor that when Texas and Arizona asked for help, that sent my National Guard troops down there to help. Rented them out. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to explain to you why I sent National Guard. National Guard are the best, and our country deserves the best. They do missions like this all the time. You give them a mission, they are trained for it, they're equipped for it, they are ready and they know how to complete that mission and then come home doing an excellent job. I, in South Dakota, have had the top National Guard unit the last three years in a row in the United States of America. They literally are the very best that you have. And they will go 
and they will complete their mission. I won't shortchange my law enforcement right now. I just won't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's irresponsible right now with what we see across the country to shortchange law enforcement. They're needed at home. They do their jobs. We send our guard because they're used to the war zone that they're going to see down there at the border. They're prepared and trained for it, and they can deal with it. So I'm thankful that the governor's asked, and if the federal government's going to fail to do their job, then governors are the ones who are going to have to step up and do it for them to protect this country. Uh, the bill, she, she left out the part about, and we funded it with a billionaire who hired the, the, them to go It's down a there. war zone. There must have been a real tough go of it when they were down there, right? Did, did anyone die? Yeah, the whole, like, they're, they're going to do their mission. Like, what's their mission? Like, be a propaganda object? Their mission is to... Uh, Force 10 from Navarone. <laughs> their it's mission... It's like a bridge too far. They, they, the, is to back up Christine Noem's 2024 presidential bid with hard evidence of how tough she'd be on those damn Mexicans. Which have gone nowhere. She's bas she's pulling behind, like, Candace Owens by, like, five points. But yeah. <sighs> Also, she also touted her COVID response. Now, I would just like to point out that as of right now, uh, five total more South Dakotans or five less South Dakotans have died than South Koreans have died from coronavirus. Jeez. Just to give you an idea. She, how but well she's her... bragging, though. At another point in that in that CPAC speech, she was talking about how other Republican governors let their constituents yep. down by imposing a lockdown. Um, and she never did. She never, ever did a lockdown. So. And those deaths are just including South Dakotans, not including all the people infected by the Sturgis rally in neighboring states. Well, which... exactly. And, and, and she gets to have this ability to say that something like that because South Dakota is so rural. But say you're like a red state and, you know, Texas locked down for a little bit. So she must be actually much more of a real conservative than Craig Abbott or whatever. It's just she's get she's dancing into as performative as it gets territory. It's going to be some fun time in the. Uh, um, all right. Should we do one more from here or I, uh, are we good or should we do one more? OK. All right. We'll do we'll save a couple. We'll spread it out during the week. You don't want to use it Good all idea. at one time. All right. Uh, oh, gosh. We got to jump. Um, folks, I'm sorry. We don't have any more time for calls. We're going to take some miams and then we're going to get out of here. Apologies. <laughs> Uh, Funky Town Tony, Hannah Gadsby's uh, stand-up special. Douglas shares uh, one of her experiences with misogyny in medicine. Highly recommended watch. Great interview today, per usual. Thank you so much for Eleanor Cleghorn coming on to the show. Uh, Illuminati Kids, using your own worldview, we can, take, uh, <laughs> we can take that OxyContin addiction overdose rate and conclude that black people are just naturally way smarter than whites. I'm sure he'd be happy with that. Uh, I'm honestly sure he would. <laughs> Aaron is not cool is the one who said you owed oversimplified and grossly understated your takes on the Biden EO on Friday. Yes. Ryan Cole, uh, please show the James O'Keefe dance off. We'll do that tomorrow. Yes. There's something in the something in the nostrils down there. It's not like something in the water. Um, Sam McKee. I'm not sure if my new taser is working. Need Sam to find out if it's really stunning. Louie, it's ridiculous that California hasn't set their presidential primary to occur before Super Tuesday and preferably on the same day as South Carolina. Which do you think would have been a bigger story last year? I suppose the corporate media could have played up South Carolina anyway, but it would have been a lot more difficult. The irony is that the Democratic candidate has no chance to win in the general in South Carolina, so there's no need to pander at all to these folks. I'm not convinced that the Democratic Party doesn't know what it's doing here. Uh, the establishment anyways that they want a they want an oversized influence by conservative states on the primary process because a lot of them well either have corporate interests or just still remember mcgovern and they're afraid of that but it will change it will change how no long will we like live in fear of mcgovern of the mcgovern's outcome forever yeah apparently Sneering atheist, uh, Sam, did you make sure your daughters didn't jack up her clothing prices after you hit a million dollar, a million uh, YouTube uh, subscribers? Glass houses, bro. Um, you know, I will say this, that like the, um, the Crowder thing, my daughter is getting a lot of like, a lot of play out of that. Uh, Sam's new book, The Art of the Grift, Sam's new YouTube channel, Cedars Tech Tips. 
Uh, two more. Nerd Cheetah. Your sarcasm regarding privately funded research versus government uh, funded research was noted. You clearly don't get that people who think they have been victimized or harmed somehow have access to lawyers and court systems to seek redress. History shows how well the exploited and disempowered are served in such a system. I'm not sure I know exactly what you're talking about, but um, I clearly don't get that people who think they've been victimized or harmed somehow have access to lawyers and court system to seek redress. History shows how well the exploited and disempowered are served in such a system. I'm not sure I follow. You got to be more explicit. And the final I am of the day, Jimmy Dorable. If you want a right to repair, reach out to Louis Rossman. We will look. All right, folks. See you. Matt, Brent, uh, Brendan, Emma. I almost said Brenda. 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 Matt, bring it back. Brendan, Emma. Good job today. See you folks tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught, but see the truth in the light bar. Finding out won't make me feel any better. Yeah, I know. Choice was made